Good morning, everybody. Welcome. This is the 54th uh, Lecoque Lectureship. Uh, I'm Howard Chansky. I'm the chair and the caretaker of this incredible department uh, that was built uh, over a period of decades by our uh, guest, although not visiting lecturer uh, today, uh, Dr. Matson. And instead of the usual uh, just sort of read through the biography uh, of the guest, I, I think everybody knows what he's done for orthopedics uh, in our department regionally and around the world. And so I'm just going to make a few uh, off the cuff uh, comments about what I think he's meant uh, to orthopedics and, and to I think many of us in here. Uh, so, uh, as I said, Rick uh, really built our program into one of the world-class orthopedic residencies and orthopedic programs, uh, certainly in the nation, and uh, I, would, I would hazard to say uh, around the world. Uh, anybody who operates on the shoulder, uh, again, uh, anywhere you go, uh, I suspect uh, they don't do that uh, before at some point reading the textbook that he wrote with uh, Dr. Rockwood uh, that's been in uh, press uh, at least since I was a resident, and that was now uh, over 26 years ago. Uh, and uh, I think everybody in the room, he's touched our careers in some ways, uh, and uh, certainly from my own personal perspective, uh, he enabled me to have a career that I, I just never thought uh, was possible. Uh, and he did that by virtue of uh, a lot of hard work. Uh, now that I am trying to fill his shoes, I can tell you the job is next to impossible. Uh, and he always made it look so easy. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'm going to have Dr. Matson come up and uh, give us his lecture. Uh, this is a great turnout, uh, better than I recall for years. And I just want to remind everybody uh, that tonight, uh, Dr. Matson's also going to lecture uh, uh, during our dinner. And uh, we have about 90 RSVPs for that. So uh, we've expanded into a larger venue with a beautiful view. And we're going to have some uh, nice weather to enjoy that. So Dr. Matson. Thank you, Howard, and thank you all for, for coming today. Um, it's an honor to be the Lecoque lecturer and follow behind this uh, august group of people. What um, I'm going to try to do in this series of talks is to, first of all, acknowledge the great support from the Puget Sound chapter of the Western Orthopedic Association and also Dr. Chansky for his leadership and for his invitation to join you today. Like many of you, I think I was uh, inspired by this book, um, which is titled Better. And um, it's just like Bruce and I were talking, our goal is always not to be great, but is to be better. And that means making ourselves a little bit more proficient, a little bit better human beings than we were the day before. And so the challenge I'd like to give to all of us is how can we make orthopedics better than it was when we found it? And what I'm going to try to do is to give you a trilogy of lectures um, with that as the central theme. Tonight, we're going to talk about how one might turn failure into knowledge, using the great horned owl as a symbol of knowledge here. Um, on Friday morning, tomorrow, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about not alcoholism, as many people thought, but rather about uh, how we can drink wisely from the limited amount of healthcare dollars that are available to us. And today we're going to talk about challenging the existing paradigm. So those are three approaches that we could use for trying to make orthopedics better than it was when we found it. And I'd like to submit that challenging the existing paradigm is what we do here in Washington, and there are many non-orthopedic examples with which you may be familiar, um, playing the guitar left-handed, uh, and a few other musical innovations, new business models that arose right here in our backyard, 
New Ways Up Mount Everest, our former chairman of anesthesiology, Tom Hornbein, decided that it would be really interesting to try to go up Mount Everest in some other route than the tourist route that uh, Whitaker and his predecessors had gone through the Southern Cum and instead went up the West Ridge and survived the world's highest bivouac at 29,000 feet. New treatments for cancer. Many of us have been touched by the innovations in cancer th chemotherapy from the Hutchison Cancer Center. New approaches to fracture care enable us to take care of bad injuries through minimal incisions and get people back to anatomic um, anatomy and full function. And to try to generate affordable implants that can be used not only in Seattle but around the world to help treat which is what is one of the biggest epidemics in the world today, which is trauma. And Lou Zirkel has certainly been a, a leader and certainly deserving of the humanitarian award that he got from the academy. Fortunately, here at the University of Washington, we have a lot of residents that have helped us challenge some of the existing paradigms. And in the next few slides, I'm gonna to try to help uh, identify the existing paradigm in italics and quotes like that, and then the challenge is going to be in uh, non-italicized uh, words below. So for example, we can talk about compartmental ischemia, which way back in the day when we started looking at this, everybody believed that compartmental ischemia was due to occlusion of the artery going into the compartment. And um, with the help of folks like Jeff Sheridan, Keith Mayo, and <coughs> Rob Beeth, we were able to show that it was related instead to increased intercompartmental pressure. And we sort of chose as our, um, our figurehead this uh, figure of Alice in Wonderland. And in this little book that we put together back in 1980, um, she took a little drink from a bottle that uh, helped her grow. And she kept on growing. And she went on growing as a last resource. She put one arm out the window and one up, foot up the chimney and said to herself, now what can I do? Whatever happens, what will become of me? And that's a question we often ask about people that have compartmental syndromes. And so we tried to challenge some of the conventional thinking and showed that uh, the key issue here was that the driving pressure, the capillary perfusion gradient, was determined by the magnitude of the intracompartmental pressure. And if that pressure was elevated, the veins within the compartment had to have a pressure that was equal to or greater than that. So as the pressure grew, the venous pressure grew, and that you know, vertical line that I've shown there got smaller and smaller, and it got to the point where it no longer met the needs of the tissue within that space. Again, at the early days of compartmental syndromes, people were thinking that you could use the adequacy of the pulse as an indicator of whether or not there was good enough circulation, or you could look at whether the digits were being perfused or not. But you can see from this particular slide that the artery is not impaired at all, and it's passing through the compartment by this increased pressure, because this pressure is not nearly enough to occlude the artery. And the veins drain outside the compartment, so what's going on with the digits has little to do with what's going on inside. It was also thought that if somebody had a compartmental syndrome, you could help them out by elevating the leg. But what happens when you elevate the leg is it doesn't do anything about the intracompartmental pressure or the local venous pressure, but what it does is to lower the pressure head so that the perfusion pressure is lowered for what goes on inside the compartment. And it turns out that if you raise the leg a half a meter above the, the patient's heart, you're lowering the blood pressure in their leg by 40 millimeters of mercury, which is substantial. And we learned that one day out at West Seattle Hospital when I was covering a patient with J.B. Smith, and it was amazing. As soon as we raised the patient's leg, he started screaming in discomfort, and when we lowered it to the level of his heart, he got better, and we later were able to confirm that with a bunch of uh, models in our own leg as we tried to pursue the pathophysiology of the compartmental syndrome. One of the bits of lore that we tried to dispel was the idea that 30 millimeters is a critical pressure. But it turns out that it's not. Uh, any more than 30, a uh, hematocrit of 30 is an indication for transfusion. It varies according to the physiology of the patient. 
And we think that far too much attention has been placed on whether the pressure is above or below 30 millimeters of mercury, because you can easily figure that the difference between 30.1 and 29.9 is negligible. And so rather than focusing on um, pressure measurements, we think that other means are better. And in this little book, we put this, these cartoons showing this gal here focusing on the pressure measurement while her patient is screaming in pain. And here's a guy who's calling for the operating room because the pressure is 60 when the patient is doing well. Obviously, we need a better indication of what's going on in the compartment. And the best is just physical examination, as we're showing here. Weakness of foot and toe extension. Pain on passive toe flexion. Diminished sensation in the dorsal first web space. And tenseness of the anterior tibial fascia. Weakness of toe flexion. Pain on passive toe extension. Diminished sensation over the plantar aspect of the foot and toes. And tenseness of the fascia between the posterior border of the tibia and the Achilles tendon. So those are the physiologic signs for, on your left, the anterior compartment and the deep posterior compartment of the leg. Again, at, back in the day, it was thought that the only way you could de decompress all four compartments was to either take the fibula out, which is a pretty morbid procedure, or you could make a two incision fasciotomy. With my fellow chief resident, um, Bob Winquist, we were able to show that you can decompress all four compartments through a single lateral incision, much less morbid, and leaves the tibia unexposed. With Joe Zuckerman, we were able to challenge the idea that it was safe to use hardware around the shoulder. And back in the day, you can see all sorts of complications related to screws and staples, but I submit that a lot of folks haven't learned that lesson yet, because still, one of the most common indications for shoulder arthroplasty is what I think Carl and I call ankle arthropathy, anchor arthropathy, where there has been just a contact with the humeral head from suture anchors that are placed so that they can contact the joint surface of the humeral head. Again, back in the day, people were thinking that the best way to measure the outcome of shoulder arthroplasty was by range of motion measurements or by x-rays. But with Bill Barrett, and you can see Sarah there, um, we were able to, I think, publish one of the first articles that emphasized patient self-assessment, patient reported outcomes in shoulder arthroplasty. And we're able to show in the graph that you see on the left the difference between the preoperative and postoperative status as characterized by the patient. And in this article, we tried to push the idea that the patient is our concern, they are our customer, they're the person we're trying to please, so it's not about the degrees of motion, but it's about are they functionally better than they were before surgery. <coughs> this is Ron Baugus, a 82-year-old guy that we did bilateral shoulder arthroplasties on, and his goal was to return to elk hunting, and he, uh, he uh, was successful in that. Um, I took my son Eric to meet him on rounds, and he always referred to Eric as my guide, and I think it's always nice to have your children be your guides, as they still are. Um, some glenoid components just loose, and people couldn't understand why some glenoid components went bad. And with the help of uh, Bill Barrett and John Franklin, we were able to show that this rocking horse mechanism <coughs> where the humeral head displaces superiorly and causes the glenoid to rock uh, is the primary mechanism for glenoid component loosening. And that is uh, obviously often associated with rotator cuff tear deficiency, allowing the humeral head to move up. Back in the day, the only way was to uh, identify rotator cuff tear was to do an arthrogram, which is a, not necessarily a comfortable procedure and is semi-invasive. And uh, with Mike Gannon, we were able to show that uh, ultrasonography was a very easy and safe and cost-effective method for identifying cuff tear pathology. And it's still perhaps one of the best tools that we have for looking at the rotator cuff enabling us to look not only at the static, <clears throat> static status, but rather the functional status as the patient tries to move their arm. Clearly with modern technology, being able to show the defect in the rotator cuff um, using this method. 
This is uh, work done by Steve Thomas. And again, there was a lot of enthusiasm back in the day for treating shoulder instability by tightening structures across the front, particularly in traumatic instability. People would try to tighten the subscapularis, tighten the capsule, uh, transfer things across the front to make the shoulder tighter than it would normally, normally be. But what Steve was able to show that just repairing the anatomic lesion with an anatomic bank heart repair was sufficient for restoring stability without compromising mobility of the shoulder. And this is an 89 paper, but still is one of the standard uh, benchmarks against which uh, repairs of instability are compared today. For a long time, people didn't think that the patient's uh, insurance mattered in terms of their outcome. But uh, Randy Viola and Craig Boatwright were able to show that in fact, uh, workers' compensation is a comorbidity and needs to be considered in the planning of surgery and uh, in, in fact the decision of whether or not surgery is a good idea for that particular patient. Acromioplasty was a very commonly per, uh, performed procedure um, and a lot of folks thought that it was essential to so-called decompress the rotator cuff and to uh, preserve a rotator cuff repair by uh, doing this kind of decompression. Uh, Ren McAllister showed that uh, that was not necessary, and we were happy that eventually the Academy adapted that as uh, one of their practice guidelines with moderate strength, saying that routine acromioplasty is not necessary. And in fact, one of the things that can happen with acromioplasty is you can take a shoulder and uh, take it from being stable and make it unstable with what we refer to as anterosuperior escape, as is shown here, where the humeral head moves anteriorly and superiorly to the acromion when the patient attempts to adduct the arm. And this has now become one of the more common indications for having to do a reverse total shoulder when the shoulder has been destabilized by a previous uh, acromioplasty. <clears throat> Many folks thought that um, a glenoid component was essential for having a successful arthroplasty. Actually, I had the opportunity of studying with Dr. Neer when he was doing the first shoulder arthroplasties, and what he emphasized was that a shoulder glenoid component, the primary reason for putting it in there was to provide stability of the shoulder, and it wasn't to provide some sort of padding between the humeral head and the glenoid bone. So with the help of Joe Lynch and Bill Montgomery, Jeremiah Clinton, a bunch of other folks, Brian Gilmer, we were able to explore the idea of just reaming the glenoid and um, avoiding putting in a glenoid component and in fact enabling people to engage in, a, in higher levels of function than they might be able to do with a standard shoulder arthroplasty. So this is a guy from Philadelphia that came to us, has bilateral ream and run procedures and is able to do unlimited activities without having to worry about fatiguing his glenoid component. Mike Lee was able to um, contest the idea that you should ream the humeral canal in preparing a shoulder for shoulder arthroplasty. What many folks were doing was to template the size of the humeral component that they'd use based on an AP x-ray, failing to recognize that the dimensions of the humeral canal are not spherical and that if you put down a reamer that looks like it's the right size based on the AP x-ray, you may well create an endosteal notch distally here which can predispose the patient to fracture. Scott Hacker and a number of other individuals helped us pioneer the idea of uh, avoiding cement using what one of our fellows called God's own glue. In other words, taking the humeral head, grinding it up, making it into a, uh, a slurry that you can use to impact within the medullary canal, and in fact, contour the inside of the bone to match the prosthesis. And one of our residents said that this sort of reminded him of the uh, Greek innkeeper Procustius, which some of you know, who instead of trying to fit the bed to the patient or to the, uh, his guest, would try to customize the guest to the bed by cutting off their legs if they were too long. And so you can see it's got the hatchet there all ready to go. But in fact, that's what we're doing is trying to customize the bone to the prosthesis rather than the other way around. Chris Howe uh, helped us look at the uh, myth that when you put in a bunch of rotator cuff repair sutures that the load was distributed equally across those and then 
um, a model here at the Harborview Biomechanics Laboratory, we were able to show that the sutures are loaded differentially. And so each suture does not carry the equal weight and how much load that suture carried depended on the position that the arm was in. And so it's important to recognize that, uh, for example, external rotation after rotator cuff repair is gonna place a lot of tension on the anterior suture. Internal rotation is gonna place a lot of tension on the posterior suture. And from that, we were able to derive what we think is the safest post-operative rehab program that avoids excessive tension on the sutures of a cuff repair. <clears throat> there was a, uh, an event back in 2000 where, um, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about this in subsequent lectures, but where pain pumps were advocated for uh, intraarticular use. Um, and you can see here, here's what you need to know about these useful tools for controlling post-operative pain. The problem is that a substantial number of these patients that had the intraarticular infusion of local anesthetics with a pain pump wound up with this condition, which is known as uh, glenohumeral chondrolysis, and it destroyed the shoulders of many young people who came for uh, seemingly minor procedures only to develop uh, serious arthritis requiring arthroplasty in people as young as 20. <clears throat> And Pete Scheffel and Brett Wider were instrumental in that. Um, a lot of us would ream the glenoid without worrying about the potential um, consequences of reaming. Um, Soren Olson came up with a very interesting idea of using an infrared camera to measure the temperature uh, during reaming. And this is an intraoperative photo, and you can see it's color coded uh, according to the temperature by this scale. <clears throat> and you can see that it's easily possible to create a temperature in excess of what's compatible with viable bone by reaming. So in the process of doing reaming, whether we're doing it with the hip or any other uh, joint, it's important to try to keep that reamer sharp and cool. A lot, <clears throat> a lot of folks believe that in order to do a good shoulder arthroplasty, it's necessary to get a CT scan beforehand. Um, with the help of Dr. Gupta and others, we were able to show um, that uh, it was only necessary to get a standardized axillary view. And this is how we take our axillary views. And we're really fortunate to have a group of x-ray techs that can get this view routinely. Uh, we call it the truth view because it reveals everything we need to know about the shoulder anatomy uh, preoperatively without needing to subject the patient to the cost or radiation of a CT scan. And then the four x-rays at the bottom, you can see how wonderfully this uh, particular x-ray view shows the different degrees of pathology that can be encountered uh, in shoulder arthritis surgery. The other advantage of this view is it puts the arm in a functional position rather than what happens when you've got the arm down at the side in a CT scan. It puts the arm in a functional position, which is really what you want to know. How does the shoulder line up when you have everything um, in, the, in the functional position? So it's worth training our text and, uh, into the technique of taking this particular uh, view and sparing them the cost and radiation of a CT scan. Glenoid loosening is obviously a problem in shoulder arthroplasty. Um, Chris and Akash uh, were able to show that when you take cultures of the uh, failed glenoid components, at least 50% of them are culture positive for propionibacter. So we have a lot of unanswered questions about propy, and uh, this was one of the papers that sort of started us on that search. And uh, we're now learning more and more, even in other implants uh, in the hip and knee, and also in spine surgery, that propy may be a reason for component failure. Um, Zahab um, did a remarkable study showing that even though the lab often reports a culture as being positive or negative, there's more information there than we uh, get from just the positive or negative side of the report. Actually, there are degrees of positivity, and in some cultures, if you look at the um, plate itself, they may have only a few colonies uh, that grow out on the plate, and others may be, as is the case here, floridly positive with lots of cultures and a high level of, um, of bacteria in that particular specimen. And what he was able to do is to derive, put some numbers on 
the culture results and coined the term the average shoulder propy score. And you can see here, for example, how uh, in retrieved implants, the average propy score differs markedly among women in the blue circles and among men in the hollow squares. So this is giving us an idea of bacterial load within the joint rather than just simply having the report come out as whether it's positive or negative. Uh, Dr. Lauder helped us uh, um, objectify the measurement of range of motion in the clinic using the Connect, and uh, this is operator independent. It just requires the patient to stand in front of the, um, the Connect system, and we were able to show a remarkable uh, difference in the active elevation measured by the Connect system between people able and unable to do the 12 functions of the simple shoulder test. I'm going to give you just a few other examples of challenging the existing paradigm and point out that sometimes the existing paradigm doesn't like to be challenged. And sometimes the fact that uh, this is counter to current thinking makes it difficult to get these articles out into the public uh, for their review in the literature. One of the common misconceptions we believe is that a rotator cuff tear is a rotator cuff tear. Most rotator cuff tears, we believe, is a problem of age-related degeneration and has nothing to do with tearing in the usual sense of the word. And these um, cuff defects increase with age, and this is males and this is females, and you can just see that the natural progression of the uh, condition over time is a degenerative process and not related to a traumatic process in the usual sense of the word tear. It turns out that um, the rotator cuff is not necessary for abduction and that there are probably 11 million Americans running around with highly functional uh, shoulders in spite of the fact that they have rotator cuff tears. I'm one of those people, by the way. Um, uh, we would like to believe that the results of our rotator cuff repair surgery are getting better over time. But we did a study where we looked at the world's literature on rotator cuff repair results, and you can see that the number of articles written about rotator cuff is rising exponentially with time, but that the results aren't getting any better. And so we're about the same degree of success as we were 25 years ago in spite of lots of new techniques, methods, and lots of literature. The goal of much of rotator cuff surgery uh, is stated to be rest restoring the anatomy of the rotator cuff. Uh, but we were able to find, again, on the review of our own experience as well as the review of the literature, that the patient report outcomes are pretty much the same whether the repair works or whether it doesn't work. In other words, people that have recurrent tears after a rotator cuff repair are as functional as those that do not. So that led us to the idea that maybe we could do something short of a rotator cuff repair when we approach these uh, rotator cuff defects that didn't look like they were particularly amenable to a repair just by smoothing the humeral scapular and motion interface. In other words, the area between the overlying acromion, clearing out the bursa, knocking off any bumpy tuberosities that may exist, and then starting the patient immediately after surgery on active motion. And so we nicknamed this the smooth and move procedure. It's done through a deltoid split, and we have the advantage of being able to return the patients to active use of their arm immediately after surgery without any need for immobilization while trying to get a rotator cuff uh, repair to heal. This is a 60-year-old gentleman from Colville, Washington, who's a big-time rancher. He had had four previous rotator cuff repair attempts, including a graft jacket had been put in, which had gotten infected. Uh, we went in and cleaned out his graft jacket, saw that he had no supraspinatus, no infraspinatus, cleaned out that whole interval, and he was able to get back to calf roping, as you can see here, with a comfortable and functional shoulder. And we actually uh, reported a series of uh, patients where we had used the smooth and move procedure in patients that had a primary irreparable cuff. In other words, we were not able to even come close to getting the ends together. And you can see the improvement in their simple shoulder test scores 
And we also, as in this case, looked at a group of patients that had had failed rotator cuff repairs, applied the same surgery to them, and were also able to make them functionally better. This is a patient we saw yesterday in clinic. Uh, he's a 58-year-old man that, uh, as you can see, had a massive rotator cuff defect involving a supraspinatus and his infraspinatus. Uh, he is now back to work as a diesel mechanic, uh, working on fire trucks. And this was the motion that he showed us Let's yesterday one more time. after his uh, smooth and move procedure done six months ago. And down. Keep in mind, he has no supra or infraspinatus. And down. Perfect. Another one of our beliefs is that we can sterilize the skin by using chloroprep or betadine. Uh, we were able to challenge that paradigm by doing some dermal biopsies in our own skin. Uh, I've got four holes in my back as a part of this study. Uh, but what we did was to prep the skin and then do dermal punch biopsies and send those out for culture. And it turned out that in the series of males where we did this, seven out of the 10 were culture positive. We then did a series of uh, patients where we gave them routine preoperative IV profiles and uh, 19 out of 48 were culture positive. And this has given us the uh, the tremendous wake-up call that every time we make an incision in the shoulder, we're very likely to inoculate that wound with propy. Can't avoid it because it's there and it lives in the sebaceous gland. So our surgery has to include the possibility of contamination of the wound routinely in, by organisms that are normal uh, inhabitants of the sebaceous glands. And this has focused our attention on intraoperative uh, uh, hygiene with lots of uh, irrigation with antibiotic saline, topical vancomycin, and other means to try to minimize the risk of this infection, which can, uh, uh, floor, RNT. can as you, floor, RNT. We're, we're on the first floor, right? Floor, RNT. And the interesting thing about these infections is sometimes they appear months or years after the index surgery. So this is a whole new field that we stumbled across and a lot of work needs to be done there. The, right now there's a thundering enthusiasm for the reverse total shoulder and most surgeons are uh, inclined to use a reverse total shoulder for the condition known as cuff tear arthropathy, which means the combination of arthritis and rotator cuff deficiency, and there's a classic example shown on your left there, upward displacement of the humeral head, arthritis, uh, and obviously a rotator cuff deficient shoulder. We've been very interested in the idea of using a, a, a simpler prosthesis shown on your right there, which we call a CTA prosthesis, and we believe that this can provide a safer and a better approach for shoulders that before surgery have retained active elevation in spite of their arthritis. Here's a lady who is now nine years after a CTA prosthesis on her right shoulder and- uh, How about straight forward and up? Fabulous. She owns a- and Can you reach up your back? She owns a big B&B &B on the- uh, On one of the shirt. San Juan Islands and Perfect. works hard every day. Now she's 71 years old and you may consider that she's not sort of your routine subject because her father was Tarzan. Uh, this is Buster Crab, who's her dad. And uh, not only was Buster Crab Tarzan, but he was an Olympic gold medalist. <clears throat> so we decided that we had to have another subject just to check out the theory that this could go well, even if Tarzan was not your dad. So here's another 71-year-old, same problem, same solution. And here's her result again at seven years after her uh, CTA arthroplasty. And the nice thing about this is the failure modes for the CTA are a lot fewer, uh, and we can rehab these shoulders exactly as we'd rehab an ordinary shoulder arthroplasty. So the last example of the uh, paradigm that we have challenged is this uh, idea that with what we call the bad arthritic triad, that this needs to be treated with something special. 
Here, by the bad arthritic triad, we mean glenoid retroversion, glenoid biconcavity, and posterior displacement of the humeral head uh, on the glenoid. And so a lot of folks these days are tempted to use special glenoid components, as shown in the middle with the posterior augmentation, uh, or a reverse, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we have instead used the Riemann run procedure for that and have shown that you can, by the use of an anteriorly eccentric humeral head component, we can restore centering of the humeral head in the glenoid and not have to worry about the problems related to uh, glenoid failure. So here is sort of the concluding slide, and I'll just let this play. This So you can see it's, as he said, don't let fear define your fate. I think that's a good thing, and I would encourage you not to let fear discourage you from challenging the existing paradigm. So thank you very much for your attention. By the way, I have gotten copies of this book, which I think is a remarkable book. Bob Cofield suggested that I read this book, and I liked it so much. I got copies for each of the residents, so make sure that you pick one up uh, on your way out. Who is the author? Chris Ahmad. We have time for questions. Thanks. Could you describe some more open areas? You talked about Kobe being one of the area for exploration, but there's lots of young people here who have a research career. Where are some other areas that there are, there are so many. Um, Did you leave any behind? <laughs> yeah, I tried to. The interesting, thing, uh, the interesting thing about Propy is it seems to me a little bit analogous to the gastric ulcer problem. In other words, we thought for a long time that gastric ulcers were related to hyperacidity, only to discover that H. pylori is the uh, etiologic agent. And uh, for a long time, we thought that shoulders that got stiff after uh, surgery was related to some issue that we didn't understand, only to find that uh, it may be related to a subtle infection with an organism that normally lives within us. Um, so as far as other areas... So within the question of propy, there are a lot of questions that need answering, like, are all propy the same? And we found out that they're not the same. And some are hemolytic. Some form biofilms better than others. So just within that topic, there's several lifetime careers of exploring it. We're actually launching on a new venture now, wondering whether bacteriophages may be an effective way of managing propy colonization. And as you probably know, every bacteria has a virus that loves to attack it. And uh, in, the, in Russia, they have done, been doing some early work on using viruses uh, to manage uh, bacterial infections, particularly those that are resistant to antibiotics. 
But as far as other areas, I think the most important thing that we can do as surgeons is to try to understand what preoperative factors are going to predict whether the patient does well with the operation that we have planned. And to me, that's got to be the most important kind of research because we don't want to be doing research, uh, surgery on people who aren't going to get better. And uh, it used to be that when somebody would show a failed case, they was, and then they'd say, well, this patient was on workers' compensation, and everybody would laugh and say, well, that's the reason that the patient didn't do well. But we have to ask ourselves, was it really right to do that surgery on that patient? And this whole business of trying to decide how to best match what we have to offer as surgeons versus who the patient is, what their social situation is, what their anatomic situation is, I think that's one of the most important areas of research, and it obviously is multidisciplinary because we have to have a better understanding than, uh, about the patient than just what their shoulder x-ray uh, shows. And that was one of the things that Dr. Neer taught me when I was his fellow there. He'd show an x-ray and he said, this is the shoulder, but what's important is who the patient is. And uh, so, and Osler made that point over and over again, said it's more important to know what patient the disease has than what disease the patient has. So I think that that's perhaps the most important area of research that we all can undertake. Other important things to consider is, and again, we'll talk about this on Friday, is are we spending our money in the right direction? In other words, we're developing a lot of new advents, and you all are going to be talking about some of them, like balloon catheters to be put in the subacromial space and arthroscopic superior capsular reconstructions, and new implants are being introduced literally every week. Uh, are we making the care of patients better, or are we just spending money on things that, that don't matter? So to me, those are the big kind of questions that uh, you all should be helping us ask. Dr. Leopold. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks for all you've given to I'd like to speak a little more on that last point, if you could. One of the things that troubles me about surgery, not just for kids, but for surgery, a difficulty can sometimes be separating the placebo effect and some of the things that you do, the actual efficacy related to it. I think you all heard the question, which is, how do we know whether we're really making somebody better? And there are two factors that can complicate that. One is something known as regression to the mean, which you may be familiar with. But patients come to you when they're in trouble. A great example is a rotator cuff defect. But most people with rotator cuff defects don't have trouble. So if they come to you when they're in trouble, Chances are, over time, they may regress to the mean, i.e. not having very much trouble with their rotator cuff. So one of the things we have to be aware of is people come to us when they're not feeling good, but most of the conditions that we treat wax and wane. So if we catch them when they're in trouble, then if we're tempted to do something for them, if we did nothing, um, then they may get better as well. And we saw a great example of that in clinic with a patient that we knew had a a loose glenoid component that was done elsewhere, but he said, you know, my shoulders feels like it's getting better. I've had a little click every once in a while, so obviously the loose glenoid is not the indication for doing the surgery, and he had managed to get by that. The, the question of placebo effect, I think, is really interesting, and the smooth and move procedure that we do for irreparable rotator cuff surgeries, you can almost consider that a, a sham rotator cuff repair because we're doing everything that you would do for a rotator cuff repair except we're not repairing the rotator cuff. In other words, we go in, we remove the bursa, we knock off all the bumps, we take out all the scar tissue, and then we, importantly, gently manipulate the shoulder under, under anesthesia because, again, one of the things Nir taught me was people with rotator cuff tears or defects often have some degree of shoulder stiffness. So in the process of doing this smooth and move thing, 
We're doing everything that you would conceivably do when you were going to do a rotator cuff repair, except you don't put the sutures in there. So to Dr. Leopold's question, that's almost like a control for all these other operations, including cuff repair, including arthroscopic superior capsular reconstruction, balloon angioplasty, all these other sorts of things. Um, but obviously, you need some sort of a control against which you can compare the procedure that you're thinking about, and that's difficult. Um, we all know about Nelda Ray's study of knee arthroscopy, where she was able to show that if you made a hole in somebody's knee and splashed water and put a Band-Aid on their knee, that they would get as much better as if you did the arthroscopic debridement of their meniscus. So it's, it's a problem, but I think we need to hold our, our feet to the fire, and particularly when we're looking at new implants. We need to say, <clears throat> why was this new implant introduced? Is it solving a problem that we have? And is there evidence that it's better than what we've been doing? The problem is that when people introduce new implants, they show that you can make somebody better with it, but that's not the same as saying that you are doing better with that implant than you would be doing with what's already been on the market for 20 years. Does that make sense? In other words, all these studies show that my new prosthesis is safe and effective because it takes somebody with arthritis of the knee and now they can walk again. So that would say hooray. But how much better is that than what we were doing before that new prosthesis was introduced? And to me, that's, that's a real key question because every time we introduce a new prosthesis, we're introducing new costs, cost of R&D, cost of marketing, cost of FDA clearance, and um, the, also, as Seth pointed out to me once, the, the learning curve, because every new prosthesis has its own little nuances and own uh, special ways of getting into trouble. So that's another cost as well. And the final cost is, if we introduce a new prosthesis today, we won't really know the outcomes of that till five or 10 years down the line. So we are abandoning ship on what we've been doing that works in our hands just for the fun of taking on this new thing because somebody special uh, said that this was a good thing to be doing. So I think it's the right question to ask. And it's going to come down to, again, what we talk about on Friday is, are we spending our, our money in the right direction? For us, we're sort of stuck in the mud doing things that we've been doing for 20 years because we haven't been convinced that a different humeral component or a different glenoid component is any better than what we've been doing for years. And <clears throat> the final th point to make is it matters who's doing the surgery. And one of my favorite phrases is the surgeon is the method. In other words, just because somebody famous says that this is a great prosthesis and works well under these circumstances doesn't mean it's the best one for everybody. Um, the fact that Michelangelo can paint well with a paintbrush doesn't mean that a paintbrush is going to work well for me. And so you have to be comfortable with the prosthesis in your hands. And my suggestion to you is get good at one thing. Don't jump to a different ship unless there's overwhelming evidence that it's a lot better than what you've been doing for years. And the purpose of this talk is not to shake you from anything that you do that works for you, but it's just to ask you to think about is there a good reason for my doing what I'm doing? Your rep reputation is such that you can adhere to things that are tried and true, and, and I totally agree with you. I'm sure that those are the best uh, prostheses, best procedures. But what is your advice for the residents who are going to go out there and, and you know be working in a really hyper-competitive world with marketing and the internet, and they're going to have patients coming to them insisting uh, that uh, they do the latest and greatest thing, and maybe even getting similar pressure from their hospital administration. It comes down to integrity. You know, if, if you've got something that works in your hands, I think you've got to continue to adhere to that. And I know that some of the local total knee surgeons are being pressed to do stuff using robotics or doing um, stuff on an outpatient basis. And unless we're confident that we can get the same results or better results doing that, I think we just have to look our patient in the eye and say, 
You came to me because of my experience and my expertise. This is what I'm good at doing. This is what I can offer you. This is what my results have been, my personal results, not the results from HSS. These are my personal results. And I'm confident that we have a very good chance of restoring your ability to walk on this knee. And I'm not sure that you would get as good a result if we did a macoplasty on your knee or if we did it with robotic assistance of some other sort. And even though the guy down the street may say that this is better, um, this is what I do. And I think, to me, your practice is going to be built on your results. And it can't be built on the fear that the guy down the street is going to take your patient away from you because you're going to get known in the community as being a thoughtful surgeon and that you have principles that you apply. And um, you can't let competitive pressures deviate you from that. And we've seen so many examples of that. Even with my own shoulder fellows, they said, well, I really got great results using what, we, what you showed me. But these guys convinced me to try this other thing, and now I've had this series of disasters. I mean, it's just, it's just not where you want to be. And as long as you're true to yourself, you'll win in the long run. And patients will respect you if you just are honest with them and say, this is how it works for me. Dr. Kennedy. A kind question. I don't know that I'm an icon of any sort, but I think what what is one of the things that's important is to read outside your field. It sounds silly, but uh, I heard it once said by a guy named Elias Zerhuni, who was a former head of the NIH. He said, 50% of what you need to know in life, you'll learn from reading outside your field." And so, read books on genetics. Read books on um, on, uh, on sociology and on politics and so on, because a lot of those things are informing what decisions that we need to make in medicine. Read things on bacteriology. Um, and read books like this, you know, where people have put some thought into how they have tried to make themselves better. So I think just, you know, JBJS, clinical orthopedics, great journals, but what you want to do is to be sure that you're spending a fair amount of time reading outside your field. The second thing is try to focus your efforts on what you think will help you make your patients better. I mean, there's no point in doing research for research's sake. But let the patients drive your behavior. And if you have a patient that does not get the result that you think that they should be getting, try to understand why that is. And that is what's led us to many of the things that we've done. We've seen patients that didn't turn out the way they should have, and that prompted us to sort of dig deeper. And many of us are uh, comforted by getting 85 to 95 percent good or excellent results from whatever we do. But the real learning is in that 5 to 15 percent that didn't do well. It's just like if you're Boeing, I mean, how much are you going to learn from the 737s that land on time? and but on the other hand, the ones that had problems mid-flight or the ones where they got close to running out of fuel or had parts of the engine knock off and knock a hole in the window so that somebody gets sucked out. I mean, those are the questions, those are the things that should drive your research. And I think if you're just, if it's always problem-oriented research, I think that is the best guide I can suggest to you. Uh, Dr. Gibley, do you have a question? You know, <clears throat> totally see the, the sort of seduction of all the new fangled gadgets that get advertised to us to use in our patients. How do you balance that with, you know, you've made a lot of new advances or new declarations in the field along the way. How do you decide when to try something new? There's been some version of a solution to most of the problems out there. Do you 
I can only speak from my personal experience, but what I've found has been most helpful to me in getting better has nothing to do with the implants. It has to do with my technique. And I think that most of the evolution of myself as a shoulder surgeon has come from improving my technique and not from buying the latest thing off the shelf. I don't really think that, I think that Dr. Kirby, Dr. Baz, maybe any, many of you could get equally good results using any of the hundreds of types of shoulder arthroplasty that are out there today. I don't think it matters. I think what matters a lot is their surgical technique, my surgical technique, and really paying attention to every detail of, of the procedure. So I think that technique is much, much more important than technology. And it would take a lot to bump me off of what I'm doing now. Like I said, incontrovertible evidence that the metal back glenoid or that uh, a highly modular platform prosthesis offers any advantage over what we're doing now. And I can give you a lot of examples. I just touch on, I don't know how much time you want to spend, Howard, but. Uh, no, we have time. So one of the great advances for shoulder arthroplasty, and it may be the same for knees and hips, I don't know, but it's the idea of a platform prosthesis, which means you put in a stem and you put some widget on the top and if that doesn't work out, you can exchange the widget for a different widget on the top without having to change the stem. Sounds like a great idea, right? The problem is that most often when a patient comes to me for a revision, either they're infected, so the platform needs to come out, or the platform was put in too high, too low, in the wrong position, in the wrong rotation, so it needs to come out. And because it was put in there either with cement or with bone ingrowth, getting that thing out is a huge technical challenge. So this is why, rather than going down that route, which sounds theoretically appealing, we've gone with impaction grafting, which makes it so easy to remove our stems if they should need to come out, and without sacrificing bone stock. So there, and this gets back to Seth's question, there are a lot of papers that are published now that say, well, if you do a revision without having to change the stem, the morbidity is less than if you have to change the stem. So that's an argument for platform prostheses in theory. But what it doesn't include is the fact that when you put the platform stem in, it is a real problem if you have to change it. And the other question is, because it's so much more expensive than what we're doing, how are you going to scale that? Are you telling me that every shoulder arthroplasty needs to be done with a platform stem because of the possibility that their rotator cuff is going to fail later and it may need to be perverted to a, converted to a reverse? To me, I don't think that's a good expenditure of money, particularly when you have a cheap solution, which is to use God's own glue to stabilize the component, make it easy to revise, and uh, don't have to go down that route. So I'm, I'm hard to move. You know, I'm like I say, I may be wrong, but I'm not in doubt. And uh, I just, I, I just want to stick with what I'm doing unless somebody can show me that what they've got is a whole lot better. And it goes across the board to metal back glenoids and all sorts of other fancy things. Dr. Cohn. The question is about the reverse. There's no question that a reverse is a solution to problems that we didn't used to have solutions to. I will quickly say, though, that a lot of those solutions to which the reverse is, a lot of those problems to which the reverse is a solution are iatrogenic. In other words, we're the people that did the acromioplasties and took this person with a functional but painful shoulder and converted it into a pseudoparalytic shoulder. And so um, the other iatrogenic reason for doing a reverse is a failed primary arthroplasty. So I would suggest if we had done a better job at the primary time, the indications for the reverse would be a heck of a lot fewer. And uh, the third reason that people do a lot of reverses is because of cuff tear arthropathy. But as we've tried to show, many of those patients actually have active elevation. And if we can just get them a smooth articular surface with a CTA prosthesis, the need for the reverse is less. And there's no getting around the fact that if you look at any series of reverses, the complication rate is between 15 and 65 percent. That's huge. Why go there if we can prevent it in the first place or treat it with a more benign approach? So I do reverses, as you know. 
I enjoy doing reverses. It's a great operation, but my indications are narrow. And always, whenever I do a reverse, I say, why are we here? Why are we in this situation? More often than not, it's because something was done by me or by the other preceding surgeon that could have been done, could have done, been done better. Robert? And there's so many examples in your field. And in other words, one of the one of the former chairmen here was Vic Frankel, and he designed. I think I may have this wrong. Brad can correct me, but I, I think he designed the the Samson nail. Somebody designed the Samson nail. Samson, as we know, is the strongest man that's ever lived, right? So the problem with the Samson nail is it was so strong that it blew the femur apart. So I mean, it, you could easily sell me. Gosh, I want the strongest nail for my patient. Yeah, but when you drive this this nail down this patient, it's it's not necessarily con conform to it. So this is a great example where they could show me a lot of <clears throat> bioengineering data showing how wonderfully strong the Samson nail is, but it's a bad thing for my patient. And Mark Swinkowski, as you know, when he was looking at a lot of methods for fixing proximal femur fractures, he compared diarrhea and nails and nail plates. What he found is the most important variable, at least in his cadaver study, was the quality of the bone you're putting it in. So I hate to quote Lance Armstrong here since he's fallen into some disrepute, but what he said is it's not about the bike. And I think it's, it's, it's my common theme here. It's about the, about, about the drugs, right? Um, but uh, the, the most important thing is fitting the technology to the patient and making sure that you are good at what you're doing rather than counting on some, what some vendor tells you. And you know, I don't want to get too emotional about this, but one of the things that really upsets me is somebody comes into my office and says, I think you ought to try this. I've got this new implant, and Dr. Jones says it's the greatest thing. I think you ought to try it. What does that mean? I mean, I'm going to take one of my patients and try this thing that I have had no previous experience on and see if I can make it work when I've got this 8,000 cases that have done well with what I've always done. Anyway, you've, you've been kind of listened to all that. No, that was great. When I, when I listen to this, if I were uh, much younger, what I take away from it is that in orthopedics, it's hard to move you, but you don't see things, you, you question everything. You don't see things in black and white. I think you see a lot of gray and a lot of nuance. And, and, and again, would you agree that that leads to some of these uh, paradigm shifts that we come up with. Exactly. And my final thing is be hard on, we need to be hard on ourselves. You know, when something fails, we have to first look in the mirror and say, did I, did I select the right patient? Did I select the right implant? Did I do a good job of the surgery? Did I do a good, do a good job of the rehab? And <laughs> All, and did I, the, the aftercare, one of the things Alex and I are worried about is a couple of patients that desperately need surgery, but we can't come up with a post-operative plan that works for them because they have so many other things going on. So it's, as Nir said, it's, it's, it's not just about the x-ray. Thank you. My name is Matthew Barron. I'm one of the residents here, uh, and I'm helping to uh, coordinate the, the lecture series for today and tomorrow. Uh, first off, thank you, Dr. Matson and Dr. Chansky. Uh, secondly, thank you to each and every one of my co-residents that uh, is participating today and tomorrow in a lecture. Could not have done it without all your hard work and effort. I know everybody's very busy, so I really appreciate it. Um, we are blessed with a few uh, local community surgeons and two of our own University of Washington surgeons that will participate in a panel that will interact with the audience and the presenter. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Carl Basmania, 
Dr. Uh, Richard Kirby, Dr. Jonah Herbert Davies, and Dr. Winston Warm. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, could you please join us here at this table? Uh, Aaron will uh, provide a microphone which you can share for responding. Uh, the uh, resident presenters will each have a, a lecture that's going to be about 10 or so minutes and include time to pause in the middle and answer questions and then take additional questions at the end and we'll plan for about 20 minutes of total time there. Uh, so first we'll start with uh, Dr. Boris Kovalenko. Good morning. My name is Boris Kovalenko. I'm a third year resident here in Seattle. Uh, and I'm going to be starting off the resident discussions with a, a quick review on a historical perspective of shoulder arthroplasty. So I'm going to be beginning with uh, Dr. Jules Emile Payan. This was a French surgeon from the 19th century uh, who's credited with a number of things. He invented the hemostat. Uh, he did the first gastrectomy for carcinoma, pioneered a number of obstetric procedures. And relevant to today, uh, he implanted the first shoulder prosthesis, which uh, actually was also the first uh, joint replacement. Uh, he was immortalized in this painting by Henry de Toulouse-Lautrec. And so towards the end of his career, uh, he attended to a patient who was a 37-year-old male baker. Uh, he presented with disseminated tuberculosis, a chronic septic shoulder, and per Dr. Payon's uh, publication, the man was almost dying when he came to see him. He came with limited painful motion, uh, recurrent purulent shoulder sores, and all he wanted was to make the pain go away and have a functional arm. Um, this was back in 1893. We didn't really have very many good treatment options. He was offered a disarticulation, which the patient adamantly refused. Um, this was a time when uh, we didn't have an antibiotic regimen to treat tuberculosis. In fact, the uh, standard of care for tuberculosis at that time that was being offered was a surgical pneumothorax, which uh, later fell out of favor. Um, so he got together with uh, one of his friends, uh, Dr. J. Porter Michaels. Uh, this was a dentist who had experience making maxillary prostheses using vitalium, which was a cobalt chrome alloy. Uh, so he and Dr. Michaels uh, fabricated this implant, which you see over here on the right. Uh, the actual prosthesis is in the top image and the diagram is on the bottom. Um, this is a platinum humeral shaft, which had screw holes for distal fixation. There were two ridges along the shaft with holes to reattach the periosteum and musculature. And there was a rubber ball for the humeral head, which had perpendicular deep grooves with two metal loops, one of which terminated in the platinum prosthesis and the other one of which terminated within the glenoid cavity. And it was attached by screws. Uh, this rubber ball was boiled in paraffin for 24 hours to render it more stable in contact with the tissue fluids. So in 1893, um, uh, he decided to try this procedure, which was uh, a new and radical idea. Um, he did a stage procedure where he first did an IND of the glenohumeral joint and then performed a proximal humeral resection while keeping the periosteum in place. Uh, during this procedure, he reported that the shoulder joint was completely full of pus. The glenoid cavity showed signs of cartilage degeneration. All the synovial membrane in the upper half of the humerus was removed, and again, he kept the periosteum. He came back at an unspecified time later, and he implanted the prosthesis, with, which I always see over here to the right on the bottom. He closed the periosteum and he closed the capsule. By post-operative day 12, the patient was ambulating. By post-operative day 20, he was successfully discharged. And at some time later, he returned. He had gained strength, gained range of motion. And Dr. Payon reported that he could use the extremity for most of the usual needs of his life. Unfortunately, he had a few recurrent abscesses towards the distal aspect of the wound, which he reopened four times and were found to communicate with the cavity along the implant. And ultimately, two years later, he had a chronic draining fistula, which couldn't heal despite multiple attempts at injection with phenol, chloral, water, potassium permanganate, camphorated naphthol, as well as other chemicals, which they tried to use to heal up this fistula. So they explained the prosthesis. Uh, images demonstrated that there was a surrounding reactive long osseous shell, which he kept in place. And per Dr. Payon's report, the bone deposition continued until there was a good reconstruction of the part with some slight shortening, and the general conditions of the patient improved postoperatively. Not much else is really known about what happened to our baker, um, but Dr. Payon highlighted a few important things that would kind of lay the ground for the future. Uh, he demonstrated the feasibility of replacing a joint in a patient. 
Uh, he highlighted the need for an aseptic, non-resorbable implant material. And he demonstrated that we had an alternative to disarticulation, which was a radical procedure. Uh, and in addition, this was a procedure which allowed patients to retain their motion. So as time went on, throughout the mid-20th century, efforts to replace the proximal humerus with inert materials continued. Over here on the left, we've got images from uh, the first modern shoulder arthroplasty. This was done by Dr. Frederick Kruger for a patient with AVN in 90, 1950. Uh, he used the cementless vitalium implant. And this uh, utilized the technique which involved preservation of the cuff tendon attachments, which is still one of the most critical aspects of doing the procedure today. On the right, we have an uh, implant which was made out of acrylic. It was used by a number of surgeons, Richard, Jude, and Rene, uh, as well as others. Unfortunately, it had poor wear characteristics, and it was prone to component breakage, so its use fell out of favor by the end of the 1960s. Then along came Dr. Neer, uh, who really pioneered this field. Uh, he, as a resident, uh, he reportedly was dissatisfied with the sequela of complex proximal humerus fractures. Uh, he spoke to one of his attendings about this, who reportedly told him, well, go do something about it. So in 1953, he published the late results of 20 unimpacted fracture dislocations treated with either reduction, head excision, or arthrodesis, and virtually all these patients had chronic pain, limited motion, and poor function. So he designed a prosthesis that he proposed would serve as a stable fulcrum for shoulder motion. And then two years later, here's some images of the implant. It was made out of vitalium, cobalt chrome. It had a press fit, a triflange neck. There was a hole, uh, which was used for fixation of the tuberosity. It came in multiple sizes, and it was designed to be implanted with 20 degrees of retroversion. Two years later, he published an uh, initial report on 12 cementless implants. This was the near one arthroplasty. Uh, with follow-up ranging from 2 to 23 months. He showed that 11 of the 12 patients in the series were pain-free, and 10 of the 12 patients experienced excellent or satisfactory functional results. The only poor results were seen in patients whose surgery had been delayed for several months. About a decade later, he published some follow-up notes on this uh, procedure in these patients. So he expanded it from 12 to 54 patients, and the follow-up went from 2 to 11 years. Um, by this time, he subtly modified the implant. It had some perforations to allow for bony ingrowth, and he also added a larger stem size uh, to help fit osteoporotic canals. With more patients and longer follow-up, he was able to demonstrate continued promise, uh, promising results, and uh, four major concepts emerged. One was the importance of the prosthesis design. Uh, secondly, he demonstrated the potential benefit of this implant for traumatic as well as degenerative shoulders. Uh, he demonstrated the importance of tuberosity fixation and highlighted the benefit of early surgical intervention. So, some years later, in 1974, he published a series of 48 replacement arthroplasties, which were all performed for glenohumeral arthritis. All these cases were uncemented hemiarthroplasties, except for one trial total shoulder arthroplasty, which had an all polyethylene cemented glenoid component. Um, in this study, he reported um, structural alterations that were seen grossly in all of these joints, uh, things that we learn about today, uh, the thinning of articular cartilage, degenerative cysts, there were marginal osteophytes, uh, ebernated and sclerotic humeri and glenoids, uh, and he also noted enlarged capsules with occasional loose bodies. One thing he noticed when he looked at the primary and secondary degenerative uh, cases was that with patients who had infection, they had more adhesions, some pebbled articular surfaces. And uh, with patients who had recurrent dislocations, they had more severe glenoid abnormalities. In addition, he uh, described the technique of doing a Z-plasty lengthening of the subscapularis. Uh, and he also, at this point, began to recommend increasing the humeral retroversion from 20 to 35 degrees. Follow-up in this study ranged from 1 to 20 years, with an average of 6. 20 of these patients had excellent results, 20 had satisfactory, and 6 were unsatisfactory. Um, he demonstrated no evidence of stem loosening, no glenoid flattening, sclerosis, or enlargement compared to the pre-op films. Uh, they did a post-mortem analysis on one of the shoulders, and they found that there was bony ingrowth onto the implant. Um, and at the end of this, he concluded that proper implant insertion, respect of the soft tissues, release of the contractures as necessary, and proper rehab could slow down glenohumeral joint degeneration, relieve pain, and be a functional procedure. Uh, here we have a picture of his uh, total shoulder uh, arthroplasty, uh, which included a keeled glenoid component. It was uh, all polyethylene and was cemented in place. 
Um, and he did this in an attempt to restore the natural arc and maintain a fulcrum for glenohumeral motion. Uh, between the years of 70 and 74, he apparently explored a few fixed fulcrum designs, but was unsatisfied with the results of these. He found that they generated insufficient power for external rotation and were prone to mechanical failures. And ultimately, he abandoned the idea of constrained arthroplasties out of a concern that leverage would be transferred to fixation on the glenoid and inevitably lead to complications such as loosening or fracture. In 1982, he subsequently published a report on his experience with total shoulder arthroplasty. Uh, and so in this, he had 261 unconstrained as well as 12 semi-constrained uh, designs. There was a minimum 24-month follow-up with an average of 37 months. So this is when he introduced the near two, which uh, was his kind of next major revision. The humeral head was modified by rounding the flattened top and overhanging edges so that way it could be used with the uh, glenoid components and conform to the radius of curvature. And so over here on the right, we see the various humeral um, sizes with various head sizes, as well as uh, stem lengths and diameters. And then on this next slide, we see the various glenoid components. Um, on the very left, component A, that was actually the component he used in his study from 1974. Uh, he felt that when inserting this, he had to drill at an awkward angle in order to get the keel in place. And so he modified this to the design seen in uh, B. And this is the one that he used for the majority of his shoulders. It was using 250, 254 of these shoulders. Additionally, he had some metal backed components, uh, which uh, C is one that he used for recurrent dislocations. And then he had some uh, enlarged components, D and E, uh, which had a 200% and 600% uh, surface area of the glenoid and were used for uh, cuff tear arthropathy. So key points from this uh, study was that he demonstrated um, all but four patients benefited from the procedure. The unsatisfactory ratings were practically all based on muscle deficits, not related to pain nor implant breakage. And he mentioned that there wasn't enough experience yet with these larger semi-constrained glenoids to establish their value and durability, but did say that these were good for defects of the cuff. So... Nier's experience dominated the um, 1970s and 1980s, but this wasn't the only implant. We had a number of other ones. Some more popular ones were the DANA, or the designed against natural or designed after natural anatomy, and the Gristina, which was a trispherical uh, prosthesis. Throughout the 80s and the 90s, we saw advent of a number of modular humeral components that tried to accommodate for the variations in the humeral anatomy and joint space available and the medullary canal diameters. On the glenoid side, some of these designs offered cementless fixation using screws and porous coatings on metal backing. In the 90s, we had an increased emphasis placed on restoring normal kinematics with anatomic location and orientation of the glenohumeral joint surfaces. Uh, also, advanced soft tissue balancing me methods and stabilization of the joint. So some other things that came uh, with time, cup arthroplasties, this was taken from the idea of Total hip arthroplasties, they actually initially started using some hip components and then developed some special cups uh, for the shoulder itself. Uh, these were found to uh, loosen. There was one study which showed that in rheumatoid patients, these loosened up to 25% of the time but didn't affect any of the clinical results. We also tried humeral surface replacement. And some of the proposed advantages of this are anatomic restoration of the humeral head uh, in the 2000s. This has had some favorable outcomes in the midterm follow-up of bone stock. But this is a, a box taken from Rockwood and Matson's textbook demonstrating the summary of options that we have for total shoulder arthroplasty. Really, we can't talk about all of them within 10 minutes, but there's been a vast number of them and they continue to come out with new systems. Um, the goals of this procedure um, are to restore comfort, function, and motion. This is accomplished by replacing the glenoid and the humeral articular surfaces with prosthetic implants. And we want to get host acceptance of the implants and implant longevity, which we achieve by using biologically inert materials. Lastly, creation of normal prosthetic mechanics and restoration of the length tension relationships is fundamental. And this is accomplished by surgical technique, which respects the anatomy and achieves solid fixation of durable implants. This is something that we want to do for patients who are disabled yet are active and want to remain active. They have the anatomy amenable for implantation and have no infection, have intact deltoid function, and are in good health. Is there anything that anyone would like to add? 
I know it's 10 minutes is pretty quick. And again, that's a, a great review. So it's, it's interesting to remember that the he invented total replacements because of poor part proximal femoral fracture. It wasn't mm -hmm. for arthritis. It was because of the, the issue of avascular necrosis mm -hmm. that happens if the, the, the articular segment is detached from the rest of the bone with the fractures. And it seems like we keep revisiting that again and again. Everybody comes up with some new way of fixing proximal femoral fractures. And, and still, if there's not blood supply in the head, they end up dying. I, yeah. I, in fact, I've seen more lately of people that have had ORAF of, of the proximal femoral fractures with the vascularcosis, and that was Dr. Neer's big, that was his, his studies with Dr. McLaughlin when he was a resident, and that's why he, he came to doing this. It, it's very interesting to, to have seen this whole progression of, of how this has worked. I, I wrote a, an article with Dr. Neer in, about revision of failed implants back in 1982. And my father, who was a famous infectious disease researcher, couldn't understand why we used the word unconstrained. He said, why, what does unconstrained mean in a shoulder? He, he thought that was so ridiculous. But, but it certainly turned out that if, if, the, if, the, if the components were linked, there was just way too much stress on the mm -hmm. bones and, and it would fail. Another interesting thing with Near too is he specifically said he really felt there was no need for a glenoid component uh, in one of his articles. And one of the big reasons they actually came out with a glenoid component, uh, you probably correct me if I'm wrong, is that another competitor came out with a uh, glenoid component that was one of the big motivating factors to actually come up with a glenoid. But he felt that he himself really, you know, there's no need for a glenoid component. So um, I think just for for background, Carl spent a lot of time with Dr. Rockwood and uh, Dr. Kirby spent a lot of time with Dr. Neer. I had that opportunity as well. And actually one of the driving forces behind the glenoid component was, was what you mentioned, which was trying to create stability of the joint because when I was there, he had a number of patients that he had hemis where they, had, where they would slip out the back. And we all know that a common form of glenohumeral arthritis involves posterior wear, posterior biconcavity. And if you put a hemi in that situation, it has a risk of slipping out the back. So at least what I gleaned from him was that the primary reason for putting in a prefab glenoid shape in the form of polyethylene was to help restore that stability. I think one other interesting thing, I think, with the glenoids is that in this, uh, uh, Rick has been uh, fanta fantastic with this, is retrieval studies. And that was one of the whole uh, things about, at least with Rockwood, you know, we were talking about coming up with the, uh, ace, uh, the diametral mismatches in the glenoids. It was because a lot of the retrieved glenoids, actually they, they became uh, mismatched, about a six millimeter mismatch. So in other words, uh, uh, his uh, glenoid components, uh, the radius of curvature is actually matched, but over time, because of cold flow and everything else, they would actually become uh, less constrained. Uh, and so that was the whole basis of the, the first uh, global uh, shoulder having the diametral mismatches in the glenoid based on retrieval studies. You learn more by your mistakes, my successes. Thank you. My name is Thomas Burns, and I'm going to be giving a brief talk on uh, anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty indications, options, and pitfalls. Yeah, giving a talk about this so closely to follow Dr. Matson is sort of akin to uh, giving a hitting instructional lecture after Edgar Martinez, but I will do my best here. Before I get started, though, I'd like to give the uh, panel just a quick opportunity to just to individually just introduce yourselves. Um, I know that Matt sort of told us who everyone was, but if you just introduce yourselves and um, let us know where you're currently practicing or practiced. Uh, I'll start. I'm Carl Bestmania. Actually, I did my residency down at Madigan and had the uh, lucky opportunity to work with Rick exactly 30 years ago, almost to the day. The, um, and then I uh, actually did my fellowship with Charlie Rockwood. I was in, uh, spent 23 years, eight months, and 11 days in the military, and then uh, spent another 
I was on faculty at Duke for altogether for almost 20 years and then decided life's too short not to be living in the Pacific Northwest again, so I moved back out here 10 years ago. And I'm over at OPA in uh, Swedish now. I'm Winston Warm. I'm here at the University of Washington. I uh, also had a background in the military, trained at Madigan, similarly to Carl. Uh, 24 years in the Army, so I guess I beat you on that one. Um, <laughs> But uh, I've been up here for 10 years, 11 years now, having a great time and enjoying it very much. I'm uh, Jonah Davies. I'm actually here at Harborview. Um, I came here from Canada. I trained here uh, in trauma, and then I trained at WashU for shoulder and elbow. And I do a combined trauma and shoulder and elbow practice. I've been back here almost two years, um, loving, loving life back in Seattle. Yeah, Dick Kirby, I, I trained here at the U. I, Rick had, had just come back from working with Dr. Neer and, and had become one of the national authorities on shoulder issues, and I had a great time learning from him, and then he arranged for me to go work with Dr. Neer as part of my, my final year of residency, which was a huge experience. Well, both were e equally important, but Dr. Matson is Dr. Neer. Um, I'm in practice. I'm actually one of Carl's partners at OPA, I'm a, I think I'd be an, on R40 this year from the University of, University of Washington. So I've been in practice for 35 plus years, and I do basically just a shoulder practice. Great. Thank you very much. I'm just going to add, I don't know if he left, but I know Dr. Matson's son in law, Kevin Coe, was there. He's also <laughs> a shoulder surgeon at the Swedish. And then we also uh, invited Craig Anst, who was uh, one of Rick's first mm -hmm. fellows, who happens to be out of the country. We have one more uh, fantastic shoulder surgeon in our department, uh, Jason Chu, uh, who for some reason is working this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I need to correct that. <laughs> so as far as my talk today, I'm going to use a patient uh, case to sort of guide our discussion of total shoulder arthroplasty. I think it would be best to just review the normal uh, versus the osteoarthritic shoulder before we get into discussion of indications and options. For total shoulder arthroplasty, uh, given that this is such a broad talk, I've narrowed it down to a to a couple topics within each of these, and then just some option or some opportunities for panel discussion throughout, uh, sort of on your views on some of the p paradigm challenges that uh, Dr. Matson had discussed earlier in his talk, and and how you have gone about. Uh, dealing with those during your practice and what you may have learned over the course of your careers. So first we start with the normal glenohumeral joint. So this is a very beautiful uh, illustration from um, the Rockwood and Matson's uh, The Shoulder. So with the normal glenohumeral joint, the goals of it are to provide mobility to the upper extremity and stability for use of that upper extremity for activities. So this is based on having a concentric joint, which is covered with smooth articular cartilage. I think it's important to note the relative size of the humeral head versus the glenoid. The much larger humeral head allows for a smooth articulation within the smaller glenoid before the tuberosities of the humerus will abut the scapular body. The uh, rotator cuff and the deltoid, along with some other muscles, uh, work to provide the mobility of the shoulder joint. The stability then comes from, as we discussed, the humeral head sitting in the glenoid cavity, but that is relatively unconstrained, as we've talked about briefly earlier. So the rotator cuff uh, provides what, what's described as a concavity uh, compression, which is illustrated here in this picture as it pulls the humeral head into the glenoid surface. This has been referred to in the literature as similar to a golf ball sitting on a much larger tee with the gravity being the, or playing the role of the rotator cuff and providing that compression and stability. Now we'll take a look at how osteoarthritis can affect the normal biomechanics of the glenohumeral joint and options for dealing with that. So we have a patient case here. This is a 79-year-old male. He's generally healthy and active. However, he has very limiting left shoulder pain that's been going on for several years. On exam, he has limited range of motion but intact rotator cuff strength. Here are his radiographs. This is the AP view of the shoulder. This shows classic findings in osteoarthritis of the shoulder. Um, the pointer here. 
So we can see here essential obliteration of the glenohumeral joint space. We see an inferior osteophyte on the humeral head, which is often described as a goat's beard osteophyte. Notably on this view, however, we, we do not see superior subluxation of the humeral head or acetabularization of the undersurface of the acromion, both, both of which can indicate um, cuff, uh, cuff tear or cuff tear arthropathy. Moving on to the axillary lateral or the truth view here, as uh, Dr. Matson likes to call it, we see the arm here in the functional position of elevation, again showing obliteration of the joint space here. We see uh, glenoid retroversion here as well, and then the biconcavity of the, of the glenoid surface or the small neoglenoid as the humerus has, humeral head has shifted posteriorly in the glenoid and eccentrically worn out the back portion of that. Now, uh, in order to characterize some of the, or quantify some of these um, changes in the glenoid and proximal humerus alignment, we can take a measurement of how far posteriorly the humeral head is shifted. We do this um, by drawing a line along the surface of the glenoid and then drawing a line matching that from the sort of anterior portion of the humeral head to the portion of contact of the humeral head in the glenoid surface. A well-centered humeral head will have a ratio of those two lines of 0.5 indicating it's sitting centrally in the glenoid. This one is, ball, is about 0.75 or 0.8 indicating that this is shifted 25 to 30% posteriorly in this glenoid. We can also use this actually lateral view to quantify glenoid retroversion. And I know there's certainly some debate in the literature about whether or not this actually lateral view can reliably provide us the ability to quantify this or if there's a CT scan that would be needed. So in order to do this, we can draw a line up the glenoid vault or the scapular body, a line perpendicular to that, followed by a line along the glenoid surface from the anterior to the posterior rim, and then find an angle there. Here, this indicates 20, this is in 28 degrees of retroversion. There are a couple different described techniques for measuring this angle as well. So then as Dr. Matson had touched on, we can, uh, we can see that this patient is suffering from the bad arthritic triad, or as was previously described, the biconcave glenoid, the glenoid retroversion, and the posterior subluxation of the humeral head. Again, this is a 79-year-old patient, um, and we know in these patients that they often can have rotator cuff pathology. We don't see evidence of this on the x-rays, but I'd like to um, open uh, up for discussion with the panel about their thoughts on obtaining CT scans or MRIs in, in these older patients or just patients in general that are going to be undergoing total shoulder arthroplasty. And then maybe a brief discussion if you've, if you've changed your thinking about this over the course of your career. For anyone who'd like to. So one x-ray that uh, people tend not to get, um, it's part of my standard series. I never caught on in the United States of the Leclerc view, uh, resisted abduction view. Uh, what we have the patients do is the we get a standard, I get a true AP so that their scapula is flat up against the plate because the uh, AP of the, what we call AP of the shoulder is really AP of the chest. And so we get a true AP of the shoulder, and then a res in, the, in that same position, we have them get a resisted abduction AP where they hold about two to five pounds, about 45 degrees away from their body. And that uh, x-ray tells me more than I need to know about the cuff with an MRI or anything because you'll have patients that have absolutely normal-looking AP x-rays. You get the resisted abduction view. When you see proximal migration, they have a large to massive tear and there's really no need to get an MRI. The only time I get a CT scan is if they have significant loss of external rotation, and even if I don't see erosion on the x-ray, I don't have the x-ray text as good as Rick does, uh, and so I, I will get a CT scan to better evaluate to see if they have a biconcave glenoid. Uh, that's about the only time I do get a CT scan, though. I would agree. The, I think the truth view helps a lot. Um, this other view sounds very interesting. Um, examining the patient, I think, is also very important to decide whether or not they have bad cuff issues. And I think you can learn a lot from just examining the patient. Uh, so I don't routinely get CT or MRI to evaluate these patients. 
We know the natural history, as Rick has reminded us, of rotator cuff disease. It's there. It's in many, many of our elderly patients. So uh, documenting that on an MRI is perhaps not the best use of our resources. Uh, so I'm, I'm hesitant to get it. However, if there's advanced changes on the x-ray and we're seeing anything very unusual as compared to this fairly straightforward case, I'm not against getting a CT scan because I think we may need to do something uh, rather, you know, interesting in terms of grafting or something else, and you want to make sure you know what you're dealing with in terms of the glenoid anatomy. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I've changed over the course of my career yet. Um, but uh, what I can say is like, I, I get the CT scan in a younger patient who I'm debating doing a total shoulder versus something else augmented or not, uh, if I'm thinking he's going to do glenoid. I do a lot of... I, I, do glenoid instrumentation, so I put in glenoid components. Um, I know that's not necessarily the, everyone's um, practice here, but I, I do a lot of that. Um, I rarely get MRI, I guess. Um, I, I use that view um, that Dr. Bessman was talking about. Uh, that's what we used in St. Louis, and um, it's, it's kind of like getting a weight-bearing x-ray for, for knee, uh, knee arthritis or for ankle arthritis. It, it makes the entire difference in the world. You, you'll see that when everyone says, oh, it's normal, and then you just get that view, and then you're like, oh, it's actually not normal. Uh, so I think for the older patients, I wouldn't get an MRI. I think it's a waste of resources, and I am from Canada, so that's a big deal to us there as well. Um, and I think, can you go back to the x-ray real quick? Yeah. Can you show the biconcavity for, for the, your junior residents? Yeah, or? so it's not, it's not showing up quite as clearly on these slides as it was on sort of the more uh, focused image on the computer, but so you have generally a spherical or rounded smooth surface here. And then in the biconcavity, we see sort of a second smaller concavity here. And that's due to the fact that the, post, the humeral head is shifted posteriorly. And that causes eccentric wear here in the back of the glenoid. Yeah, I would say in this one, I'm not sure because I can't really get a good view. But it looks like that is very... Um, uh, like a lot of posterior subluxation, and those are the really tough ones to balance, to get a good balanced shoulder. These are sometimes when they, they, they um, dislocate or they subluxate at the back that much. These are the ones that now uh, Walsh Group calls the B3, right? So they're, they kind of look like they're only retroverted because that the anterior portion of that biconcavity has sort of erased completely. And those are the ones now that a lot of people are talking about doing something a little bit different. So... I guess I'll, I'll accept my role as being the challenging the norm here. But uh, these are ones that some people would say they would do a primary reverse for these, these, type, of, uh, these type of patients. So. So, so I think on this patient, I probably wouldn't do any additional imaging. I, I think you can see pretty well what's going on. Most patients with an x-ray like this have some degenerative change in their rotator cuff, but typically not a significant rotator cuff insufficiency. So that wouldn't change my my surgical approach. Again, I, as you just said, I, this to me looks like more like a posterior slope glenoid rather than the dr dramatic biconcave like Rick showed us with that mm -hmm. earlier view. Um, and I would certainly take that into account in deciding is this total versus hemiarthroplasty. If I did a total, could I take down enough of the front of the glenoid to, to, to make the prosthesis perpendicular without taking away so much glenoid that there wasn't adequate glenoid fixation? Okay, thank you very much. And so then just briefly to review some recent literature on uh, MRI and rotator cuff injuries and total shoulder arthroplasties. This is an article out of the Stedman Hawkins Clinic in South Carolina in 2017, where they looked at 45 patients who underwent total shoulder for glenohumeral arthritis. The average age of these patients was 65. These Patients all had a preoperative MRI and were followed for two years with postoperative outcome scores. None of these patients had a complete or full thickness tear of their rotator cuff. Those patients were excluded. What they did find in these patients, though, was that 40% of them had a greater than 50%, so a significant partial thickness cuff tear, a Goutelier classification grade three or four in the rotator cuff. And f uh, for everyone, the Goutelier classification is talk uh, or, uh, classifies the amount of fatty atrophy within the cuff muscles. So grade three being at 50% of the muscle is 
has fatty atrophy and four being greater than 50%. And then 7% were found to have a positive tangent sign on the MRI, the tangent sign being um, an indicator on a uh, sagittal view of the shoulder with the line drawn from the superior aspect of the scapular spine to the coracoid process and this, uh, the supra, um, spinatus muscle belly should come above that line. If not, then they, then that is considered a positive tangent sign. That's an indicator of atrophy of the supraspinatus muscle. So those are secondary, uh, secondary indicators of cuff degen degeneration. And they found that in patients with these uh, cuff tears and other signs of degeneration that they had no difference in reported functional outcomes at two years of follow-up. One thing they did note, though, was that the patients who did have the fatty atrophy, so the Gutalia classification grade three or four, had decreased post-operative range of motion, which was one of the findings of their study. So their conclusions were essentially that patients with these findings on MRI did not have significantly worse outcome scores at least at two years. And so this, I think, goes to support the uh, panel's discussion that you know, MRI really in these patients does not ch change management. Uh, so now with our uh, patient case, so we've looked at this case as relatively straightforward glenohumeral arthritis. And so he has um, undergone non-operative treatment. He's failed stretching, strengthening, physical therapy, anti-inflammatories comes back to us, tells us he's still having pain at night, pain with activity, and his rotator cuff, again, is intact on physical exam. And so under, indicated to undergo a shoulder arthroplasty. So then the options for that, which have been touched on it, are performing a humeral hemiarthroplasty, where we just uh, resurface or um, focus on the humeral aspect without doing anything to the glenoid, doing a ream and run arthroplasty, or a humeral hemiarthroplasty with a glenoid non-prosthetic arthroplasty, anatomic shoulder arthroplasty addressing both sides, and then reverse total shoulder. In this talk here, uh, we'll focus only on the ream and run as well as the anatomic shoulder arthroplasty. The other topics, I believe, will be covered in later sections. So with the ream and run arthroplasty here, again, this is the humeral hemiarthroplasty with the glenoid non-prosthetic arthroplasty. Pros of this surgery are in avoidance of the prosthetic glenoid. There's been discussion about whether or not that is something that has been needed from as early on as the initial uh, inception of shoulder replacements. And then also, as we saw in that well choreographed video, there's a less long-term activity restrictions as we saw that gentleman performing every single sport I think he could in one day. The cons are that in the fact that there's a more intense rehabilitation required of a ream and run arthroplasty versus a total in order to achieve essentially the same, the same results. So early uh, outcomes reported in 2007 by Dr. Matson and his group showed showed similarities in patient record, reported uh, outcome measures um, up to 36 months. I think what's interesting, or this, was in a, this is in a uh, match study between total shoulder arthroplasty and Riemann run patients. There are 35 matched patients, and they found that there was essentially no statistical difference in the self-reported outcomes at all time points except at the one month period. And I think that this is thought to be due to the intensity of the rehabilitation in these patients and that at, at, at one year, they are still maybe not where they want to be compared to the, the total shoulder arthroplasty patients. Following up on that study, there was a uh, five-year follow-up of 140 patients initially in the two-year group and then 106 patients who were available for follow-up at the five-year group. And this study showed that the patients who underwent the Riemann run shoulder arthroplasty were just as satisfied at, at two years as they were at five years, essentially. So in the appropriate patient, I think that these are, have been shown to be a very, a very good option. And so then I wanted to open up for a second uh, panel question, just thoughts, thoughts and experiences on the Riemann run or the non-prosthetic glenoid resurfacing. Um, how often have you done these, and then from patients who have failed these and gone on, any red flags that you've seen and learning from your experience about, you know, why you think that patient maybe in hindsight wasn't the best candidate? So 
so I, I'd say most of the hemiarthroplasties I do, I don't do glenoid reaming on. I, I, I think it is more painful for the patients afterwards unless there's, it doesn't appear there's a concentric fit between the, the humeral component and the patient's native glenoid. Um, I, I would tend not to do any reaming. I think, I think it's, it's unnecessary and doesn't improve, improve things. And, and I've seen a number of patients that do seem like they have quite a bit of pain for a really long time after the, the ream and runs. Um, but I, I do agree that it's certainly much safer to do a hemiarthroplasty on active people. I've got one on my, on my own, I, and I didn't have my glenoid ream, but I've got good motion and good function on my dominant left shoulder at six years now, and it's let me still do things. I didn't, I'm not worried I'm gonna have a glenoid that's gonna get weakened by the active stuff I do. Yeah, so I've done probably 50% Riemann runs versus uh, totals in my practice when I recently looked at this, and we have somewhat of a bias in that many of our patients come and are interested in that procedure, so I get the uh, opportunity to work with many patients who are, we say, highly motivated. And uh, I think one of the important things to look at is, uh, you know, the patient expectations, how hard they want to use their shoulder, their age, etc. So it's an individual decision. Uh, and the case you've showed us is a guy who's 79, and you haven't told us a lot about what he does. Is he a farmer still no. throwing bales of hay around? No, he, he's not. He's probably not a candidate for, for this based on his level of activity. Right. So that's a very important uh, distinction. You know, obviously we want to respect the patient and not put them through a more arduous rehabilitation if, in fact, they're not going to put those types of demands on their shoulder. But uh, in, in this particular case that you showed, I agree with uh, Dick that the, it, it really wasn't as much biconcavity that uh, I could see on this x-ray anyway. Maybe other x-rays show that. And so in that particular patient, I don't know that reaming would be needed. Uh, however, in many cases where there is biconcavity, if you try to put hemiarthroplasty in there without reaming, the, you're not going to change the way the joint is functioning. You know, you may decrease some of the crepitation, some of the roughness, but you're going to continue to have point loading, which is going to lead to continued pain. And the idea of the reaming is to have a nice concentric base that's stable for the shoulder and allows the patient to spread out the forces on the whole glenoid and that uh, will eventually decrease uh, their pain and improve their function. Yeah, I think it's, it's important to talk about, you know, you know, like Rick was talking earlier about patient expectations. I, I, a lot of these true bog, uh, concave glenoids I tend to see in fairly young, very active patients, and that's a real dilemma. So, I don't think a 70-some-year-old is a real dilemma. A 40-year-old with this is a real dilemma uh, for what you're going to do with it. Um, I do, I don't, uh, do an aggressive ream and run. I do what I call a move and smooth, or smooth and move. It's a variation where I'll gently reshape the glenoid, and this is it's a tedious procedure. By scraping the glenoid in multiple different directions, you can actually reshape it and get rid of the biconcavity, but you don't really truly violate the subchondral bone. I worry about going through the subchondral bone because it can weaken it, and so I try to preserve as much of the subchondral bone as possible, but you've got to get rid of any biconcavity. Uh, like I say, I think in an older patient, it's not as big of a deal, but in, uh, I think in a young active patient, uh, the last thing in the world they want to be talking about is a reverse. And even I worry about putting any type of glenoid in a younger patient. Um, and it's, uh, I think this is one of the big areas we still have to work with. I'm one of the designers of the Steptech glenoid, and I, get, I can tell you it's an extremely hard device to put in. And so it's an option, but um, like I said, I still try to avoid... Uh, putting a prosthetic component, a glenoid prosthetic component in these patients. And I think in the interest of time here, we'll move forward here just to talking about some of the things that have been touched on for dealing with the biconcave or extremely retroverted glenoids, the, the Walsh B2 classification or maybe the B3 as uh, Dr. Davies referred to, and the different techniques for dealing with this. And sort of at the end of this, I'd like to hear, hear 
your approaches to some of these things include eccentric anterior reaming, where we're taking down the anterior aspect of the glenoid, often at the expense of a significant amount of the glenoid bone stock, and then the um, effect of that being needing to downsize the glenoid and then leaving a lot less for a revision if necessary in the future. Also, glenoid bone grafting, which in the literature has sort of mixed reviews and is often thought to be a, a technically demanding option for supplementing posterior deficiencies in the glenoid. And then uh, the posteriorly, sorry, Dr. Benson, the posteriorly augmented glenoid with the, uh, the sort of the step cut glenoid here, which again is used to bolster the uh, posterior aspect of the glenoid and try to prevent posterior subluxation of the humeral head on the glenoid and that edge loading, which leads to the, the rocking horse phenomenon and the, the loosening. And so, again, options for this being the eccentric reaming, the glenoid bone grafting, augmented glenoid components. And then as Dr. Matson talked about in, his, in shifting the paradigm, just not changing it, just leaving the glenoid in its retroverted position. And so last question for the panel is, is do, we, do we need to correct the glenoid retroversion? I know Dr. Matson covered that a little bit earlier. And then if you don't correct it, what other techniques do you perform during your arthroplasty to prevent that posterior humeral head subluxation? And then if you do have experience with it, those other options, what has that been? I know that's quite a few questions, so maybe we could just address maybe one each. I mean, I th honestly, I think some of the uh, the true type C glenoids, I almost it's a normal variant. I think. Um, I think it's also a variation of a it's a form of a hypoplastic glenoid because you also see the same type of situation too, too where you get a, usually they look like they have a type C glenoid. So if that's their normal anatomy, you really don't want to change it to you know, quote you know, true normal anatomy. Um, I, you can't put a glenoid component in when it's retroverted. Studies have shown you get up to 700% increase in micromotion. With a, if you have a 20 degree retroversion and you put a glenoid component in that, it's dooming it to failure. Um, I do try to decrease the retroversion. I don't know why. It makes me feel better to think that I slightly got it back. I try to get it to around uh, 10, uh, 15 degrees. You really can't ream the front down more than 15 degrees because then you start getting into the base of the coracoid and you get a much smaller glenoid too. Uh, so your options are pretty limited, but like I say, I think uh, I do try to reduce it a little bit. Um, the uh, bone grafting, uh, the only thing I'll say about bone grafting, if you're feeling bad about yourself, don't do bone grafting. You'll be suicidal by the end of the case. And uh, it's just the most miserable freaking surgery you could possibly do with a, a less than a 40 50% success rate. Uh, as far as managing these uh, types of difficult glenoids, uh, it's it's very challenging, and each case is individualized. Uh, in this particular case, I think you would be fine um, just uh, accepting the retroversion that you have, and even a hemiarthroplasty may be uh, very adequate. But what needs to take place at the time of surgery is you need to check the stability of the shoulder and the soft tissue balancing. That's going to tell you an awful lot. So our tendency is to try to want to have an algorithm we can look at as we look at these x-rays and we look at um, CT scans perhaps and, and think, oh, well, in this patient we're going to have to do this. And it's certainly good to have a preoperative plan A, B, and C. However, what's very important is at the time of surgery, the balance of the shoulder. So in this person, I think I would be looking at potentially an eccentric head where I might be placing that anteriorly to allow the shaft to stay a little posteriorly where it's been for a long, long time and uh, see if we can get the soft tissues balanced there and then we won't have issues down the road with posterior subluxation. Um, I do both those things. So minimal retroversion correction to somewhere 10 degrees uh, anterior head um, matching so that the, the humerus uh, remains posterior. The thing you were asking about, the augmented glenoid. So there's good biomechanical data that says that they do help restore uh, the shoulder. The thing is, I've seen three of the top shoulder surgeons in the world do this and have to bail out halfway through because it's such a technically demanding operation that if something goes wrong, um, you can not resurface it correctly and then the, it won't accept the glenoid. So at least two different times um, in live surgery in front of a hall like this where they've had to just bail out to a reverse because they've basically... Uh, had to go through the back. So 
I think if you're going to do it, you better be sure that you know how to do it and <laughs> have a lot of practice on cadavers before. Um, just goes back to the point Dr. Maxson made is um, sort of testing on our patients is probably not the best idea. And if you're going to do it, be sure that you can give a good result or as good a result as what your current standard is. So I'm interested to know on, on a case like this where there's the, the retroversion of glenoid, if, if any of the panelists do less retroversion of the humeral head component to try to match that I, I've, I have a head I can put in somewhat eccentrically, but I also tend to do a little bit less retroversion on a case like this if I think the, the glenoid doesn't need to be reamed to, to concentrically articulate with the head, but I'll put the, the humeral stem in with somewhat less retroversion. Comments on that? Yeah, I, I agree. I do the same thing. I don't typically change it much. Uh, I will change it. What I try to aim for is with the arm in neutral rotation, I feel like the head should be pointing at the center of the glenoid. And so that's the rule I use. And so it, it, it just sort of try to match. I just had one yesterday where it's significantly retroverted, and I did anavert the humerus, uh, not a huge amount more. You don't, never want to go past neutral, but the, uh, actually, uh, uh, the, the range of retroversion is from plus 5 to minus 55. And so there's huge variations. But like I said, just the goal I want is just to have the head facing in the glenoid. Because you retrovert to say if they've got a, that type of thing, if you, got a, if you put your uh, humeral head in 30 degrees of retroversion, by the time they internally rotate, that thing is you know, really trying to go out the back. Mm -hmm. All right, well, great. Thank you very much. I think that's all I have time for, and I've gone quite over, in fact. Dr. Matson, do you have any thoughts on the panel discussion? or? Just real quickly, I think that the points made are wonderful, and in this particular person, 79, what you don't want to do is to do anything that's going to harm him, and I think that trying to do <coughs> elaborate procedures like bone grafts and stuff would be off my wish list, and I sort of like what the panel has said. I think this guy could perhaps be really well served with a heavy heart. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> because he's, he's almost reamed his glenoid down to a concavity, and if you can just match that concavity, and then, as they all said, do whatever you need to to adjust the position of the humeral head component, the soft tissues to balance his stability, I think that's probably the most benign surgery in him. If he's got an intact rotator cuff, I don't think this is going to be a particularly easy reverse because, again, he's got a lot of retroversion, trying to decide how you're going to orient that, getting exposure. So 79, the guy's got another 10 years to live. Do the easiest thing for him. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will be discussing indications for and biomechanics of reverse total shoulder arthroplasties. First, I will discuss a problem not solved by conventional total shoulder arthroplasties, then go into the role of the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty in attempting to solve this problem. Moving on to indications and limitations of the reverse total shoulder, followed by details of the biomechanics and some of the early design components. And I will end with a case example. Treatment of patients with glenohumeral arthritis in the setting of large, irreparable cuff tears is a challenge. Rotator cuff arthropathy leads to superior migration of the humeral head and superior displacement of the center of rotation. This alters the biomechanics of the deltoid and can result in the development of pseudoparalysis. Anatomic total shoulder arthroplasties in patients with rotator cuff arthropathy leads to shearing forces producing superior eccentric loads on the glenoid and glenoid loosening, the rocking horse phenomena. Hemiarthroplasty provides pain relief, but no improvement in active elevations in patients with preoperative pseudoparalysis. The goal of the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is to treat glenohumeral, point, glenohumeral joint disease in patients with severe rotator cuff deficiency. It does so by restoring deltoid length, creating a fixed center of rotation. Some of the indications for reverse total shoulder arthroplasty include cuff tear arthropathy, pseudoparalysis due to an irreparable cuff tear, severe proximal humerus fractures, either those that are acute or the fracture sequela, prosthetic revision in a cuff-deficient shoulder, and patients with rheumatoid arthritis. For the panel, any indications you would add to the list or dis disagree with? 
and how much rotator cuff deficiency is needed before you go to a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty? Yeah, I've got to admit a bias. I, I'm the guy who invented the CTA, uh, so I think it's an incredibly good device. Uh, Ludwig Seebauer and I published a paper a while back where we tried to figure out, tried to come up with some sort of classification where who would do good with a CTA, who would do good with a reverse, and it was pretty simple. Uh, what we found is that patients with the pseudoparalysis, it seems like it's all or nothing. Either they can go to 40 degrees or they go to 160 degrees. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot in between. And uh, so the simple algorithm we came up with, that if they can raise their arm up at least 90 degrees, that proves they've got uh, stable kinematics. And ideally, they should have a good subscap, and usually need a good subscap to get to 90 degrees. If they can do that, they'll do fine with a CTA. If they've got pseudoparalysis, they'll do better with the reverse. Um, uh, some, a lot of studies have actually shown if you put a reverse in someone with 150 degrees of forward flexion, they're going to lose motion. And you know, we haven't even talked about the loss of internal rotation with quite a few of these things. So I, I think it is indicated, but it should be very specifically uh, cuff tear arthropathy with pseudoparalysis. I don't see inter or superior escape up there. Am I missing it? I guess it's an advanced form of cuff tear arthropathy. So that, right. that would be something that I would think... Rick showed a very graphic example of how that type of patient really won't do well with anything short of a reverse. Um, I think we talked a little bit about it, but a severe B2 or a B3 in some places is an indication. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but they're talking more about it. And then if you go to Europe, uh, indication is having a shoulder now. Uh, so, so that's something to look out for. Yeah, to, to, to me, the, the, the whole issue with the reverse is that we just don't know how, how well they'll hold up on, under stress. And, and they talk, you know, we're not really restoring the, the deltoid to its normal position. We're stretching the deltoid to let it make up for the insufficient rotator cuff. And so there's the risk of that. There's the, the occasional chromial stress fractures. It's, it's, a, it's a stress on the shoulder to have a reverse. It's a fabulous bailout for these people with arthritis and cuff arthropathy that can't reach above 90 degrees. But I, I agree I would not do a reverse on anyone who could reach. Right, I, I would do more like 120 or 130. At 90, I've, I've done hemis on those, and they had less afterwards that didn't make it either of us happy. But if, if people have overhead reaching, that that's what I never had previous surgery. I have a big rotator cuff tear, but I always had overhead reaching. So I just have a regular hemiarthroplasty, not a not the extended head, and it, and it works fine because I have a good deltoid and a good subscapularis, so I could reach up anyway, I think. Thank you. Now moving on to some of the limitations. The reverse total shoulder arthroplasty requires a functioning deltoid and axillary nerve. The patient needs to have sufficient glenoid bone stock. The prosthesis does not restore external rotation. There are limited options if the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty fails, and there's limited long-term data available. Does anyone from the panel have any other limitations or experiences they'd like to share? Sorry. Moving on to some of the... I, yes, sorry, Dr. Kate, Warren. to interrupt you, but you can get good external rotation on the lateral offset design with the reverse. And I have videos of patients with 90 degrees of external, active external rotation inside. So um, it's not always the case. Certainly mm -hmm. with the more Grammont design, you limit your external rotation postoperatively, but not with the lateral offset designs. Thank you. The early design of the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty focused on lateralization of the center of rotation outside the glenoid. This maintained the anatomic center of rotation, as you can see by the radiograph in the corner. This was a constrained design as well. This led to high forces at the bone implant interface, leading to breakage and glenoid component loosening. Dr. Paul Gramont introduced his version of the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty in 1985. This was revised several years later to the Delta III, shown in the image on the screen. The modern reverse total shoulder arthroplasties are based on the core principles developed by Grammont in his Delta III prosthetic. Some of the key principles involve a fixed center of rotation. This is distal and medial to the level of the glenoid. An inherently stable construct. The deltoid lever arm, which is effective from the initiation of a abduction or elevation. And a semi-constrained joint. This is achieved with a large glenosphere 
and a small humeral cup. Overall, this results in a stable construct while allowing the deltoid to compensate for an absent rotator cuff. Looking at the center of rotation, the native glenohumeral joint has a variable center of rotation throughout the arc of motion. There's a different center of rotation for the humeral head and the glenoid. Both of these are close to the center of the humeral head. Conversely, in the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, there's a fixed center of rotation. This is the same center of rotation for the humeral and glenoid components due to the match radius of curvature. The glenoid, uh, excuse me, the center of rotation is localized to the glenoid face. The center of rotation is medial, uh, as seen in the image. In image A, you can see the center of rotation in the native glenohumeral joint is localized in the humeral head versus at the surface of the glenoid in the Gromont prosthesis and is also inferior, which decreases scapular notching. The absence of the neck places the center of rotation in contact with the glenoid surface, which reduces forces at the bone implant interface, overall decreasing glenoid loosening. Inherent stability of the construct stems uh, and is exemplified by the increased balance stability angle. This is the maximum angle of joint reaction forces before dislocation occurs. In a conventional total shoulder arthroplasty, the net humeral joint reaction force vector must be directed within 30 degrees of the glenoid centerline to avoid dislocation. This is phi on the image above. Conversely, in a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, this angle is 45 degrees. The equal radius of curvature and increased constraint from a deeper glenoid component result in this increased stability. Additionally, there is an increased stability ratio, which is defined as the maximum subluxation force over the joint reaction over the joint compression force. This is 0.5 in the native glenohumeral joint, one in the conventional total shoulder arthroplasty, and greater than two in the reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Moving on to look at deltoid function. Function in a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty is optimized by using the intact musculature. It retentions and repositions the deltoid in relation to the center of rotation. The medialized center of rotation increases the deltoid lever arm by 20 to 42 percent. This enables recruitment of additional fibers of the anterior and posterior deltoid to assist with abduction. The inferior center of rotation restores the tension in the deltoid and improves the efficacy in the muscle by 30 percent. As you can see in this image, the native uninjured shoulder has a well-tensioned deltoid uh, and center of rotation in the humeral head. With a rotator cuff, the center of rotation moves superiorly, which results in laxity of the deltoid, making it unable to function effectively. With application of the reverse total shoulder, the deltoid is retentioned, enabling it a biomechanical advantage. With the medial and inferior center of rotation, all three regions of the deltoid are now able to assist with abduction. This lowers the force to abduct and flex the shoulder and enables the deltoid lever arm to be effective from the initiation of movement. Enhanced torque producing capability of the deltoid can compensate from impairment in the initiation of torque resulting from a supraspinatus deficiency. Looking at the semi-constrained design, this stems from a large glenosphere, which allows for a greater potential arc of motion and a small humeral component, covering less than half the glenosphere. This overall results in an improvement in range of motion before impingement occurs. Looking at some of the complications of the early Delta III design includes scapular notching, as you can see in the image here, There is impingement on the uh, humeral component on the glenoid, resulting in breakage of the screw, uh, the most inferior screw, and one can imagine polyethylene wear. There can be component loosening of the base plate, the humeral component, or dislocation of the glenosphere with the base plate. There was glenohumeral dislocation or instability that was seen. There can be fractures of the chromion or scapular spine, periprosthetic fracture, infection, and nerve injury. Change in implant design, such as a lateralized center of rotation, seek to address some of these issues. The lateralized center of rotation in newer implants is in relation to the medialized Gramont design. This is still medial compared to the native glenohumeral joint, as seen in image C. 
This provides humeral clearance and, and decreases the scapular impingement, overall reducing the incidence of notching. Moderate implants vary in their lateralized offset, types of component fixation, eccentricity of the head, neck shaft angle, glenosphere diameter, and glenoid base plate tilt, which can overall influence clinical outcome. Above are several of the more modern implants used today in reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. As you can see, the components are very similar to Grammont's Delta III design. For the panel, any features of a reverse total shoulder implant that you particularly like or modifications that you find beneficial in your hands? The, uh, honestly, the, one of the biggest changes we made was going to an eccentric lenosphere. That virtually uh, eliminated notching. Um, it got to the point where with the old uh, style, uh, the first, uh, uh, what do you call it, the Delta uh, three, uh, the incidence was like almost 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah, almost everyone has some type of notching. And we tried everything. A lot of that lateralization that um, was done was because they didn't have an eccentric option. So the lateralization did help a little bit with that. Um, but the biggest change I saw was going to the eccentric lenospheres. Um, even by moving it down two to four millimeters, it's virtually disappeared. It's, yeah, occasionally we'll see like a grade one or two notching, but I haven't seen anything more severe than a grade two notching with it. So I think that was probably one of the biggest changes I've seen. Yeah, in terms of what uh, is important with the reverse, one of the things to consider is the remainder of your rotator cuff. So very few of these patients are completely missing their teres minor. Many of these patients have repairable subscapularis tendons. So while the superior cuff is, is gone, uh, the remaining cuff is still important to consider. And when you have a Grammont type design that pushes the arm down, while it can effectively improve the function of the deltoid as you've shown us, uh, the remaining rotator cuff is gonna be very unfunctional or non-functional. And so the lateralizing designs, I think, make a lot more sense because it puts the shoulder back in a more normal attitude. If you look at Shenton's line, oftentimes we can make Shenton's line of the shoulder, uh, restore that. And then the remaining rotator cuff tendons can do what they're supposed to do and add stability to the shoulder and improve the patient's ability to rotate the shoulder. Yeah, I think there's different technologies, different ideologies, I should say, of how to do it. There's different ways. If you're going to do one technique or the other, if you're going to do more Grammont style, then inferiorly placing the glenoid is a good way to get around that. But it comes with an offset. There's no necessarily perfect technique, but I think if you know your implant and you're able to give a reproducible outcome and you will be able to avoid these, these uh, problems. I was sort of a, a slow adopter. I, I'm so adopter in a lot of orthopedic things. I, I am still at zero suture anchors for my lifetime, but I was so slow with the, with the reverses because there was such a high complication rate. Rick was saying 65 or 70 percent, and I remember first seeing the reverse at a international meeting in Paris in 1989, and I thought it was a joke. And a lot of the early ones had some great successes, but some, some just as great failures. So I've only been actually doing them for the last seven or eight years. To me, this, this is now sort of third generation equipment, and, and something that gives a good fixation of the glenoid base plate, allows the, the glenosphere to be eccentrically below the, the base plate so that it, it's minimizing Notching, I don't think there's zero notching, but, but you can sort of be minimized. Um, and it's really amazing to me with these how people have, they regain extra rotation strength and abduction strength where the, the deltoid can, can basically take place for the absent rotator cuff tendon. So, so I think it's been an amazing answer to us for a problem for which we didn't have a solution for a very long time although certainly not a panacea, and, and, and as whoever says, every patient in Europe is a candidate for this, th th there's an awful, awful lot of people I see that, that have bad cuff arthropathy that I give them a shot every few months and say, tell me if this gets too miserable for you. I, 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 it's nothing I go to as a, as a first treatment for anybody. Hey, yes, of course. Thanks. Sorry to so usually when you've got a third generation whatever, not a sign that either of the first two generations was perfect. And these are really complicated environments, right? And there's a lot there's a lot of things that can go wrong with complex system by any definition. And so each 
time we change something to try to improve upon a problem that we've observed, we risk you know, having a revenge effect down the road. What's your, what's your standard for adoption of a new device? What standards do you use? <coughs> Um, I, I was sort of lucky. I actually, I got to go over to Europe a number of times before it was introduced in the United States. And the reason I didn't like the reverse, I didn't like the concept of it. I got to admit, some of it I didn't really understand at first. Uh, a little bit of a side story. One of the first uh, lectures Paul Grimond gave, he was actually booed off the stage because everyone thought he was out of his mind. And it, I got to admit, when I first read his paper, I thought he's out of his mind. And um, yeah, I didn't appreciate the subtlety of that, you know, moving the center of rotation immediately, and that made all the difference in the world. The, um, it was one of the reasons why I wanted to use it was out of desperation. I had patients that just had nothing we could address with. And um, so it seemed to serve a purpose in that regard. Uh, it also points out that uh, the need for, uh, this is a tough device to put in perfectly. And matter of fact, I, <laughs> when I first started doing these, I was at Duke at the time, and one of my assistants said, should we just go ahead and schedule all the patients for two surgeries <laughs> so we do the revision afterwards? And I said, yeah, that's not funny. Uh, and the, um, uh, so there, was a, there is a pretty steep learning curve with it. But again, my reason to adopt it at that point in time was desperation. Uh, I just had these patients that I had nothing to offer to. And so it's, I would say, uh, once you see it, though, invention's the mother of necessity. Uh, my biggest fear with these things, they get severely overused and misused now. Yeah, to answer your question, I also went to the reverse out of desperation for patients who had done pretty miserably with hemiarthroplasty who had, they couldn't get a total shoulder because they had this, you know, risk of rocking horse loosening. We tried to do a hemi, we did all the right things from a rehab standpoint, and they really couldn't move their shoulders and they were very, very unhappy. So uh, before I adopted it, I went and did some surgeries with a surgeon who was doing them. and. Uh, gained a lot of insight into the implant and then slowly incorporated it into my practice. Well, I think if you get in, uh, problems with the, the device that you're using, that you see the shortfalls of it in, in your patients that you're caring for, then you have to start looking at other options. I've been lucky and haven't had to switch the implant that I'm using. The, uh, I have changed the stem uh, version because it's made in such a way that the revisions are much simpler. It's designed such that if you have to do a revision, uh, it's designed with osteotomes that fit right through it, and you can get this thing out quickly. So that's the only change that I've made so far in the, say, 12 or plus years I've been using it. Kevin, I don't want to put you on the spot, but Kevin Cohart, our, one of our new partners, um, just did a, a shoulder fellowship and, and, of course, used the prosthesis that they had there. And my understanding is you, you've sort of done a number of different, or have tried some of the different prostheses. But what was your rationale for, for which one you use? And, and are there, there times you'd use one versus another one? Uh, when I first showed up to Swedish. Um, and it was interesting because when I, I trained at Rothman and um, Dr. Williams, Jerry Williams, was one of the big um, designers on the initial um, Delta. And he we put in a lot of Delta implants when we were there. But he was also going through a transition, I think, uh, to the DJO prosthesis, which has um, been the, kind of the next iteration with the lateralized design. And I think that for me, um, I mean, I have a lot of different influences from Dr. Williams and Dr. Matson, and knowing a lot of the shoulder surgeons in this area. But I think my, my current implant of choice is to go to this DJO prosthesis. And I, I think it comes from um, fixation of the glenoid. Um, I think a lot um, of the fixation techniques have improved with a centralized uh, screw. And in addition to adjust the amount of lateralization, I think it just gives you a lot more ability to um, adjust the implant to the patient's anatomy. And I can't say that I've honestly, I mean, I'm only in practice for three years, so I can't say my practice has evolved at all. It's, so it's, um, um, it's just when I started practice, more or less. 
I just wanted to add one political statement. And, and when you go to these big meetings and listen to these people talking about their devices, keep in mind that a lot of them have a vested interest in that device. And I'll admit I've got a bias because I've uh, been a consultant with Depew for over almost 30 years now. And you know, so there is a bias there. So take everything with a grain of salt. I mean, uh, yeah, I try to use other devices, but like say, you know, at these, you know, the big meetings, uh, always be a little bit cautious of taking everything at face value. Moving on to a case example. There's a 56-year-old woman who presents with many years of right shoulder pain and weakness. On physical exam, her active elevation is limited to 30 degrees. MRI, which we will look at momentarily, shows a massive rotator cuff tear with tendon retraction. Above her are radiographs, which show only minimal glenohumeral joint disease without much retroversion and no biconcavity of the glenoid. However, our MRI shows retraction of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. She has failed conservative measures and had, has marked pseudoparalysis. What are your options at this point? Do you have an age or activity threshold for patients to whom you offer a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty? I still prefer to have older inactive patients. I still use the old recommendation of 70. I get uncomfortable below 70. Having said that, the youngest patient I've done is 42. Um, uh, I had sort of a pit in my stomach as I was doing the thing, but it was her 14th shoulder operation. And it was, this was a salvage procedure. And there was a lot of counseling ahead of time saying, you know, in all likelihood, this is going to fail before you, your body fails. And, um, you know, there's a chance that we're going to have no bailout for this. And so you just have to be really, really honest with the patient because we have no data. Uh, that's the one thing I'd sort of you know, say to the whole orthopedic community. We've been extremely negligent in producing good long-term follow-up data on this. I mean, the best we've got is 10 years, which is that's laughable in the total hip and total knee uh, realm. And so it's one of those things where uh, you have to be very honest with the patient, saying we don't have long-term follow-up. Uh, you may end up with a flail shoulder uh, if this thing fails. And so, you know, as long as they understand that, um, I think that's important. But like I say, the younger they go, like I say, I'll, I'll easily go down to 60 now with the reverse. Below 60, I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Below 50, I'm very uncomfortable. The other thing, too, is when, a seven, when you take a 70-year-old who has no function, they want to feel like an average 70-year-old. When you take a 40-year-old who has no function, they want to feel like an average 40-year-old. And one of the hardest things I see is holding these people back because they want to do everything, you know, go to the gym, uh, do you know, everything possible with it. And uh, I just get concerned it's just going to wear out even quicker. Yeah, I don't have an absolute age threshold. Uh, I think you have to always look at the patient. And this particular patient, you've told us she can't elevate her arm. But uh, I don't know that you've told us exactly how badly this is encumbering her lifestyle and hurting her and if she could be managed. And, you know, many of these patients have adapted to this arm. Uh, it's not like this happened immediately. So... Um, if she's actually doing pretty well, a little uncomfortable, you know, an, uh, an injection like Dr. Kirby mentioned could actually ameliorate things for several months or several years. There's no rush to run down the road to uh, a total shoulder or, in this case, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. So I'd be slow to pull out a big gun in a younger person. Yeah, I think I agree. There's no absolute age. There's a psychology in talking to the patients and some 55 year olds will be fine and some 70 year olds will not put a reverse and you know the ones we were talking about earlier the farmers or the those guys you got to be careful. So you just talk to them and these are the ones that you might want to you might want to date these patients a little bit before you start to get involved in a in a surgery. So have them come back, have them you know evaluate, have them think about it um, so that if they do get the surgery and uh, they're okay with those restrictions. They've already sort of made their peace with that and go on with it. Um, so that, that's what I would say. And I, and I do think it's, it's crucial to that pain be a big component to for your indication for surgery. Just, just as function, I don't think, is a reason to do almost any shoulder surgery. Um, unless there are people are having pain, you can make them have pain or have problems or have complications by doing many of these operations that we do. So if she just has a, a shoulder, she can't reach up well, it's almost better to, to work on her environment than on her shoulder. If she's really having a lot of pain with it, then at 58, that, that would make me nervous also. But if, if, 
if you if you've exhausted the other possibilities, then it wouldn't be unreasonable to do a reverse. Uh, yeah, I think the preoperative counseling is extremely important. It, it goes both ways too. I had this one patient came in; she was 81, had cuff tear arthropathy, you know, fairly severe arthritis, but she could forward flex to about 100 degrees or so. But I thought, well, she's 81. Uh, the reverses do recover much quicker than the CTAs do or a HEMI, and so I thought, well, uh, uh, she's probably a better candidate for uh, reverse. And so I always talk to them about activity restrictions. They said, we don't want you lifting heavy weights. I said, I don't want you repeatedly lifting more than 20 pounds. And she, she stopped me right then and there. So I don't want it. I said, really, why not? And honestly, got truth. She said, my favorite pastime is bench pressing. And so she got a CTA, and she did extremely well with the CTA. <laughs> Yes, Dr. Leopold. Sorry to keep interrupting, but this is just too much fun. Um, so, you know, we spent a lot of time this morning looking at sort of one or two line histories, one or two line physical exams, and a lot of pictures. Uh, and yet everybody's talked about listening to the patient, talking to the patient. So I'm curious on the panel how your opinions about what you just said would differ if the patient had well treated depression or poorly treated depression. If the person came in on no narcotics or four Vicodin a day or 180 of MS content a day or whether this was a workplace injury or wasn't a workplace injury or was no injury at all. How do you factor those kinds of things in? Are, are any of those, you know, no-go no -go decisions for you? You bring up an excellent point, or many points, and uh, I think the overall looking at the patient, getting to know the patient is, is critical. Uh, in terms of, I'll just take on one of your points you made, and the depression issue is huge in my mind. So. Uh, enough studies have shown me that you can do the proper surgery on a well-indicated patient who's depressed and they won't get better. And so that should put the fear into every surgeon in this room to take to heart whether or not people are really significantly depressed prior to signing them up for surgery. And we're, none of us are uh, psychiatrists, I don't think, in addition to being orthopedic surgeons. So it's not an area of expertise that we have, but we need to get savvy with it and we need to make sure we're getting some indications on their level of depression on intake forms, et cetera, and, and be attuned to that reality as opposed to worrying about filling your surgical schedule. Uh, think very carefully about depression before you sign people up. If I could just make one quick comment about this case. One of the things we haven't discussed is, is there any role for rehab in a patient like this? And as you've all pointed out, there's plenty of time. This is not like a surgical emergency to do anything. And I've seen a number of people who were sent to over for reverse total shoulders that, as Dick says, weren't that uncomfortable. They just lacked the function. And putting them on a simple deltoid rehab program was sufficient to get them a lot more functional, and so and they were happy, and so they sent me, were sent in because quote their doctor said they needed to reverse, but just like with the knee, uh, there's something about having a dysfunctional shoulder that makes your deltoid not want to work, just like dysfunctional knee makes your quads not want to work, and I've been impressed with the role of some just simple rehab, and what I tell the patient is, if you try rehab, you've got two chances of winning. You may avoid surgery, or if you have surgery, you're going to have a better shoulder after surgery. So to me, it's, it's something that we need to think about. And to get to the point of depression, there's nothing that is, a, in my practice, it's a better assessment of somebody's attitude than they're willing to take on a rehab program. And if they've got positive motivation or willing to do their exercises, can come in and demonstrate what they've been doing, that answers a lot of the questions that we have about their motivation. This particular patient had daily pain, limitations in her ADLs, had tried extensive non-operative measures, including an extensive course of physical therapy. Ultimately, she underwent a right reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. She recovered well, and she achieved forward elevation past 90 degrees. She now returns eight months later with pain in the left shoulder. She has a rotator cuff tear on that side that was repaired several years earlier. On physical exam, her awkward, active forward elevation of the left shoulder is 90 degrees. MRI, which unfortunately is not available for our review, reveals postoperative changes to the greater tuberosity with metal anchors consistent with her prior rotator cuff repair. What are your options now? 
And would your recommendation change if she had less than 90 degrees of forward elevation? So again, no, no appreciable arthritis on the your AP X-ray. There's not the mm -hmm. narrowing of the subacromial space. Um, you, again, you wonder if you did the, the X-ray that, that Carl does, if you would see the that space go away with with act, active abduction. Um, but I think it's I think you, you start this shoulder just like you do every shoulder. You don't say, "Geez, you already have a reverse in one side," because and some people say that it's like I don't want to go through all these steps. Mm -hmm that I did before I had my previous surgery done. But I think you still want to go through the steps. It's a, it's a new issue, it's a new shoulder. She's still got reasonable function with it better than you described that she had on the other one. And again, starting with rehab, maybe injections from time to time, um, a non-surgical approach at least to begin with until you convince that you've exhausted the other possibilities. Yeah, I guess I would just reinforce that and say, what's you know, what is her issue here? Like, do you have a diagnosis for her? Because she's had rotator cuff surgery. We don't know if it's failed the MRI. We don't really have, but we don't know is it failed rotator cuff surgery? She's not able to move that well, or is it pain? Or just kind of identifying more of what her problem is instead of just jumping on and say, well, we did well on one side. Let's just do the same thing on the other side. Yeah, I agree, nothing really to add there, except both of her shoulders showed a little anterior subluxation on this view. Her humerus is a little bit posterior, so it may be artificial, but I'd be also thinking about her subscap as we're evaluating everything else. Yeah, assuming she's been through assuming she's been through rehab, one of the things I like to try in the clinic is just a simple lidocaine injection and see how their function is. If it improves, then I'll uh, uh, consider them for just a scope debridement. She undergoes a left shoulder subacromial decompression with resection of her hypertrophic bursa and removal of the prominent uh, bone from her greater tuberosity. Operative findings are significant for an absent supraspinatus and infraspinatus and an absent biceps tendon. She has an intact subscapularis. When seen for follow-up, she has great pain relief and demonstrates 145 degrees of active forward elevation. She now returns one years later with increased left shoulder pain and inability to forward elevate past 90 degrees, requesting a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. As you can see, there is now retroversion of the glenoid. Is there any reason not to proceed with a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty? I think that looks like antiversion, but upside down x-ray view is looking like Yes, excuse me, antiversion. It's interesting how osteoporotic she seems. Does she have other ongoing medical issues of concern? Uh, she has osteoporosis noted uh, diffusely in other locations, yes. Because again, it's, it's the same issue. She still doesn't have glenohumeral arthritis, mm -hmm. so it's not technically cuff arthropathy, it's cuff insufficiency. Correct. Um, that sounds like a, like a good, at least short-term result from, from what was done with, with the the subacromial decompression and, and smoothing. Um, I, 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 again, I think I do the same steps again and not necessarily go right to the reverse. Just based on that, evaluate what her subscap was like because then the, when these patients that have a balanced cuff tear lose the balance of their cuff tear and they lose the ability to elevate. So, you know, on her physical exam, if she has any indication of a, of a subscap tear, or if you can't really get a good exam because of pain, then ultrasound or MRI even. But to me, that's kind of what it sounds like. And if she doesn't have a lot of um, arthritis, which she doesn't appear to have, and you have a massive rotator cuff tear, then there's a question of whether or not you can do something to rebalance the tear temporarily or not, you know, to get them more function. Yeah, quite often, you know, they don't have to be completely subscap deficient. If they lose their upper third, uh, it's almost like losing the whole thing. So I'll actually, you know, you know, like you were saying, if they do have an involvement of the upper part of the subscap, because sometimes you'd be misled because you test their external rotation and they have a very good endpoint, and that's if they have the you know, entire, uh, even the lower two-thirds. But that upper third is crucial. So quite often, if they fail something like this and you just really, really look at that upper third, I'll go in and just do a limited repair of just the upper third of the subscap. She undergoes a course of physical therapy, but ultimately uh, undergoes a left reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. 
She recovers well and at most recent follow-up, three months post-operatively, had achieved over 90 degrees of forward elevation on the left. She is overall pleased with the function of both of her shoulders. Now in this example, the patient had a history of a rotator cuff injury. She was fairly young in her late 50s. How would your recommendations change if she were in her late 70s or even in her 80s and she had an intact cuff on the second side? Specifically, is there any role for a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty as a primary procedure in an elderly patient with an intact rotator cuff to prevent future failure from a degenerative cuff? I'd say no, because at least with the one I use, you almost have to remove part of the cuff to do a to make the 155 degree cut. That is one of the advantages of the more lateralized ones, uh, is that the um, you don't have to make that you know, more of a drastic cut. But the um, you do, uh, you know, I, I see this happen a lot. I see people coming in with the thing. If their cuff is intact, um, I think part of the problem is that one of the reasons the standard anatomic total shoulders do well is I think we keep them immobilized too long. We're actually studying this right now where I've given, I do not use any immobilization after a, uh, ar a standard arthroplasty. And you have to trust your subscap repair. And so I've got this way of repairing it that I really like. And if they can be moving early, uh, I can show you numerous x-rays of people six weeks out already have full motion. I just had a gentleman the other day who was in his 70s at a standard anatomic. Three days before his six-week checkup, he played around to golf. And so I think uh, that's one of the things you have to look at, too, is are we artificially creating problems with excessive immobilization after these procedures? So the question was, how would we change our management with the elderly patient? Is that it? Who had an intact rotator cuff tear right. on their side, but had a rotator cuff tear on the other side. Yeah, I think this this is very uh, tempting for a lot of surgeons to put a reverse in, uh, especially when they don't do a ton of shoulder arthroplasty, because oftentimes the results in the reverse are more uh, reliable. Uh, they don't get as stiff as often as something Carl's talking about. You got to get these patients moving quickly with uh, total shoulder arthroplasties. So, um, you know, it's it's important to think about that. But uh, I wouldn't be tempted to put a reverse in if there's an intact cuff. I think you got to stay away from that because we don't have a crystal ball. We can't say everybody's cuff is going to fail. So respect the anatomy that's there and use it for the patient's benefit. I agree. There's studies right now going on looking at primary reverse for um, standard OA in patients above 70 that they're currently recruiting and they're comparing it to standard TSA. Um, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. You know, the idea that these patients that are high risk, like a rheumatoid arthritis patient that might develop it, you limit them. I would say if the patient can't do the rehab, so if they're 85 or eight, you know 89, but they're really debilitated, they're pretty active, you know, everyday stuff, but they're not going to follow rehab. That might be an indication, like pseudo indication, to do a reverse because the rehab is easier for them and they get back to their general function quicker. But otherwise, if you have a good cuff and you have arthritis and you know how to have do good surgery, then just do a, a total shoulder and they'll probably do fine. You know. Thank you.